morning, good day, and good afternoon. Maybe even soon good night for some of you. A warm welcome to the Ignite conference and day two of the Sweden Innovation Days. We are so happy to have you with us. And even though you might feel alone at home right now, we actually have more than 3,500 people signing up from more than 78 different countries. I think that's amazing. And I'm hoping that we can make a big difference here today. And let us be active and not just sitting there, maybe doing some other things, but really be on our first poll, maybe be in the chat. Sharing is caring, right? So share information, contacts, whatever you can to really be interactive in this conference. So. Yesterday, we had more than 40 speakers from 10 different countries at day one, where we talked about transforming Sweden in the rising era of AI through national and international collaboration. The theme was together, how we can make change for the future by collaboration with startups and academia, corporates and the public sector. Invest together, share with all, is a quote from AI of Sweden, one of the organizers of this event. Together with Vinova, Ignite Sweden, Swedish Energy Agency and SISP, we are able to come together in these three days that will create value for the future. But let's dive into today's conference. More than three and a half hour, actually. And day two is all about how AI is transforming our present with startup and corporate collaboration. And we will have a lot of deep talks, case studies, startup pitches, and of course some Swedish fika as well. But first, our grand opening of today. And I know that we will be inspired by Sweden's startup expert. She is the Minister of Enterprise and Innovation of Sweden, and I know that she thinks innovation is crucial and collaboration is the key. Give a warm welcome to Marie Wall. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here today because this initiative, Ignite Initiatives, really means a lot of me, for me. So I would start to really argue for why I think that startup collaboration might be the most powerful innovation strategy for implementation of new disruptive technologies for most companies out there. You probably do not agree me with me, but let me argue for my standpoint. First of all, innovation can happen in two different ways. Either it's tech pull or it's tech push. With tech pool, you have a problem and the goal is to find the right technology to solve that problem. With tech push, you have a technology and the goal is to find uh, the solution where this technology can really make a huge change and even disrupt business change. In most cases, we prefer to have tech pool as an innovation strategy. And it's usually the strategy that larger corporations are pursuing as well. But tech push can be very, very powerful to bring new, advanced, disruptive technology to market. Many startups in the AI field are typical tech push companies. They are born from a deep understanding of the technology, technology that might have been developed in, by talented individuals in research lab all over the globe. The challenge for those startups is really to identify a problem or an opportunity where their, their competence, skill and talent can make a huge change. When a problem-centric tech pull innovation process is matched with the tech pull uh, push innovation process of startups, then we have a really great, great, really perfect match for disruptive change. The second reason why I think that startups collaboration is so important and the most powerful innovation strategy is really talent. Talent is the world's most precious resource. Top of mind for many bosses in companies all over, all over the world is how to find ways to tap into the huge talent tools out there, outside of their own companies. Even the largest companies recognize that many people are working on similar prob problems that they do outside of their companies. 
So do you really believe, as a huge company, that you can attract the best and brightest? Probably not. But do you believe that you can work with the best and brightest startups out there? You bet you can. A positive side effect is that it will probably be even easier for you to attract the best and brightest to work for you if you're a large company, if you allow them to work with the best and brightest of the startups. So it's a win-win. So, but then how do larger companies create the conditions to tap into the startup talent pool? Distance matters. But networks matters even more. Networks between facilitators in the ecosystems, networks between companies, and networks between individuals. The Ignite model is a really powerful tool to stimulate the spread of ideas and create strong networks. Networks between large companies and startups, networks between startups and public sectors, network between startups that together can take on the challenge to become the next unicorn. Network that connect ideas with problems. Networks that connect talent with companies. And networks that connect people and ideas. Uh, I'm so impressed, really, by what you have done with Ignite. The number of connections that will be facilitated by this event alone is 400 carefully matched meetings prepared by 64 people from ecosystems all around the globe. The connection you will facilitate for others, as well as the network that you have been building along, among the people in those ecosystems, will be a really powerful engine for the next generation of innovation. Innovation built on open innovation and startup collaboration that will drive AI adoption, that will create the condition for startups to become scale-ups, and that will create the conditions for larger companies to stay competitive in the future. So this is really why I believe it's so important, and the work you do is really instrumental for the growth, not only for Sweden, but for all of the companies in our country. Thank you so much, Marie. Really inspiring to hear that. And we are so looking forward to tomorrow and all those meetings, actually, and to follow up what Absolutely. What change will that be? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, for me, actually, Ignite is all about that collaboration and creating value. My name is Maria, and I'm working at an incubator up north in Sweden, in Umeå. And uh, a few years ago, one of our startups came to me and said, Maria, we really have to join Ignite Sweden. They are doing an amazing job with creating this platform for us as a startup to meet uh, different corporates. And we all know that this is really so crucial for them to meet that right person at the right company at the right time. And that takes a lot of time and effort that they don't necessarily have. So for me, it was really a turn point when I met, or actually what was matched with uh, the champion behind Ignite. And uh, I am so inspired by her passion of creating a change, always with a heart at creating value for the startups. Uh, a big warm applause from me to you. Uh, welcome, Stina Lanz. You're the program manager at Ignite Sweden. Uh, and uh, tell me, how did it all start? Wow, yeah, it actually started only four years ago. And um, it started by Per Hedberg at Sting and Linda Krondor at Things. Uh, they actually asked me if, uh, if this could be an interesting project to test, to match startups with potential customers, because we Many of us that have been working with startups all around Sweden, we saw that we had a huge problem. And the startups didn't get their first customers in Sweden. They didn't get the second, not the, not the third, not the fourth or fifth either. They more often got their first customers on other continents, which led on to that they got their first huge investments in other continents, which led to that they placed their head offices on other continents, and of course, moved from Sweden, from Europe. And that also meant that all our large companies couldn't grab this opportunity to actually innovate together with the startups because they didn't see them as relevant for their innovation work. So that was the scope. 
And uh, since then, what has happened? Did uh, how many meetings and uh, what was was it any challenges along the way? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's been so many challenges, but uh, I'm super happy that we today are so many devoting our time and energy in this as you, Maria, are. Uh, we are Ignite is not a company, it's a non-profit organization and the built by the building blocks are the incubators in the Swedish incubator exosystems and of course the, the science parks. Our home organization since this summer is the national organization for incubators and science parks in Sweden. And this is actually what makes Ignite possible. Uh, so we are all having our everyday job helping supporting startups to grow and thrive and finding customers. But all together, you in Umeå, for example, then you're also quite alone. It's very tricky for you in Umeå, working with your local yes. startup ecosystem to actually match your startups with the perfect customer, if the perfect customer is in south of Sweden, in Malmö, for example, Alfa Laval. Mm. So that's actually what Ignite does. We are building the bridges. We are helping you build the bridges for your startups to access the most relevant and important customers, both within the public sector and the private sector. Mm. And I know, I mean, there are more champions now. You were the first, really, but we are many. And uh, there are also many champions at the corporates. And we will later on listen to a lot of interesting cases and stories. But I love the unexpected meetings and the unexpected things that happen. Can you share some, uh, some of those? Well, uh, at first, of course, our main mission, or is always and every day, is of course supporting the startup to find the first perfect customers. Uh, and that's what we do. But it's not always a match that looks very obvious on the paper. Often the startup might have developed something until a readiness of 80% maybe, but need the potential customer's reality to adapt and, and really find a market fit and the technology fit for the product or the service. So that is, of course, I would say that more than half of our meetings are a little bit unexpected. These two parties would never have found each other if we haven't been facilitating this and seeing the connections and helping them connect the dots. But there is a lot more. Uh, we're also having or we're also seeing that uh, there's a lot of spin-outs that startups have actually met during uh, the Ignite matchmaking days, found each other and created new ventures together, and that's quite interesting. But we also see that one startup also can connect, aha, you as a big company have this challenge and that company have that challenge, so we all of three of us are creating something uh, extra together to solve this. Mm. And we also see large companies working together uh, on solutions that they would never understand that they could do if they haven't met uh, in our ecosystem. So did you think this four years ago, that we will be on this point doing a global event? No, <laughs> I didn't really think this. And I think we actually have a picture of all the countries uh, that have been co-creating this event together with us. Um, and I think that's just amazing to, to see exactly. how many of the all the countries and all the different incubators and uh, different persons that are really having the passion of, uh, of doing this together. Uh, and I mean, there ha it has been a journey and it's just taking new different parts and our first track is actually going to be of the public sector and i know that you were thinking mm, i don't know if this is a nice way to go or if it could be challenges uh, working with the public sector can you tell us yeah first of all i when i got the question that would you be interested in trying out Ignite or, or creating Ignite together with us. And I was like, okay, that's a mission impossible because we wanted to foster collaborations between startups and corporates. And we had we set the goal of 10 collaborations, commercial, which means that some invoicing must go from the startup to the corporate and be paid to count. Uh, so we set the first goal for the first year for 10. And I myself have been working in startups and scale ups, tech scale ups all my life. And I know that this is a very, very, very long sales process to actually get the invoice paid. So um, 
when my colleague uh, Linda Krondal from Things uh, a couple of years ago said, well, we should try this with public sector. I was like, no, no. Now we're actually starting to succeed with the private sector, uh, with the public sector, then you have the public tenders. And that's like mission impossible for a startup. So I think we should stay with, with our low hanging fruits, so to say. That wasn't that low hanging anyway. Right. But um, I also love challenges and I think that's, we ha all of us in Ignite have that in common. Yes. So we decided to give it a try. And here we are now having that as our first track and we'll listen to a really inspiring story. So let's move on to our first track out of four. We have four different tracks, transforming democracy, transforming energy and transforming industry and safety. So I think we are ready for a movie. Let's go. Hi, my name is uh, Johan Rosén and I work at uh, Uppsala municipality as a strategic advisor on enterprise development. And uh, right now I'm involved in our ambitious innovation initiative aimed at bringing uh, together public and private sector, uh, the academia and uh, the civil society in addressing the city's needs and challenges. We are uh, redefining the way you understand people so we can collect uh, millions of opinions in very short time and apply algorithms to uh, identify trends, the most common thoughts, the most uh, apparent feelings and so on. We have built a platform where we can uh, collect data from any kind of source and that can be panels, it can be social media, uh, it can be newspapers or whatever. And then when there's information coming in there, uh, it gets sucked into our system, uh, analyzed by our algorithms, and then transformed into data, which we then present and visualize in our dashboard. And in this case, uh, as part of our planning for a future art museum in Uppsala, uh, we decided to do a citizen survey. And the purpose was to find out more uh, about our citizens' uh, knowledge, experiences and views on our local uh, art museum. And we wanted a new innovative way of tackling this in order to get, get as rich data material as possible. And through Ignite, we got a fantastic explorative collaboration with the startup company Parlametric and from their solution based on free text answers with added smart analytics, we got the rich data we needed to proceed. And without Ignite's great matchmaking process, this uh, simply wouldn't have happened. So the result of the collaboration uh, was that we got to work with uh, uh, a lot of more cities uh, and also that we were able to fine-tune our business model to, uh, to quite a large extent. I would recommend Ignite Sweden to others because they help uh, take the first steps to commercialization and to validate uh, innovations. And uh, let's go deeper into this collaborative story by Uppsala Municipality and Parlametrics. Let's move on to uh, Johan Rosén at Uppsala. Tell me, Johan, how did it all start? Uh, this case, you mean, or our journey yes. with Ignite? Uh, you can start with this case. Um, yeah, so uh, after I um, introduced Ignite internally at uh, the commune or the, the municipality, we were trying to set up some really good uh, matchmaking um, uh, events and uh, occasions. And first out was the cultural department. Uh, and um, one of their main challenges was that they, um, we have this really um, ambitious project of uh, building a new art museum. So um, we wanted to um, 
find out what what people really thought about our current or the our already existing art museum and what they wanted to see more of and also where should it be located if it were to be uh, at another spot than it is today and since we wanted to do a really in-depth uh, analysis uh, of this uh, uh, we needed a new way of conducting um, a uh, citizen dialogue or doing a survey or we wanted to do this in in a completely new way because we we know pretty well what certain interest groups and lobbying groups in the city think of this but uh, we have an obligation as a as a city to listen to as many citizens and taxpayers as possible so we were actually actively looking for a new way of, of doing this and then uh, in this uh, matchmaking, in a matchmaking session that Ignite helped us to set up, uh, me and a colleague from the cultural department met with a few startups, and uh, Parliament. We instantly felt that uh, Parliamatic was a great fit for us. Um, so uh, that's, <laughs> that was a long answer to your question, where. It, all started but that was so that was uh, how it began but I was personally uh, very convinced or uh, I liked the whole idea the whole setup of Ignite the first time I heard about it from um, uh, Jenny Battling who works at Stockholm Business Region and um, I would like to give a shout out to her for uh, making me meet up with Stina and Linda uh, so early on so um yeah, so, so that was the and beginning. The beginning, the, the starting point. And uh, so a little bit of love at first sight. Was it the same thing for you, Johan, uh, from Parlametrics? How was your first meeting with Uppsala? Can you tell us uh, about how you entered the meeting and uh, your journey since then? Yes, um, yeah, I would really confirm that this was uh, love at first sight. Um, because we had a very well-defined problem. Uh, I mean, you're having these 12 old culturally interested people in a library dictating the art museum of Uppsala. That's, that's not a very, I mean, we wanted to change that and said, let's, let's aim for finding 500 to 1,000 uh, Uppsala citizens and really dive into their minds and get their, what do they want? And that's exactly what we did, and that's what we do. I mean, trying to, to get this bigger picture, to be a full service provider, uh, and have a very like good relation with the client, and uh, uh, you know, doing these iterations of the product of the delivery together with uh, Yuan and his colleagues. So it was a, a very very nice uh, project, and it led us into other cities. So it has been a tremendous uh, effect of this. And, and so was it clear for you and at Uppsala, your next step, how would you, would you proceed after that first meeting? Um, you mean with, with just this case? Yeah, or just this case. How did you take your next step? I mean, it's always case. easy yeah. to see. So from both of you, if you start with you, you want from Parlametrics. It's easy when it's two Johans here. Uh, so starting with you, what was your next step uh, to get in contact with Uppsala and how did you work? I mean, what we did was basically the first meeting, the first Ignite matchmaking was very good. We got a good like, background and then having the first meeting, trying to just um, tell them what we actually could deliver, what problems we solved and be very clear about the time with the, the price everything to be really try to be crystal clear and then also to to say that look we will do this in a very you know uh, iterative way uh, we will do this together and we will uh, you will have the opportunity to uh, to work with uh, the data and together with us so i think that was a very natural way into a continued relationship because that's then we had a mutual interest and we started to uh, to meet again and so on and then the project was rolling and and for for you you want at Uppsala uh, i mean it's a big organization uh, what internally did you have to work on how was your process things like this is uh, you're very much dependent 
on uh, having the right people involved. Uh, and that goes for the, the private sector as well as the public sector. You have to define the right people who are very, who works with this uh, specific uh, case or project in Charnley in Comuna. So, but, um, so that was a lot of, a, a, a bit of a footwork I needed to do uh, with some help from, from uh, um, a guy called Patrick at the Culture Department in finding the right project managers uh, uh, as soon as possible, who also were very open for, and also, also very vocal and, and uh, open about that they wanted uh, a new way of conducting this survey. So once I found those people and sat them in the same room, uh, because once in a time we could actually sit in a physical meeting uh, and and uh, and after that everything i would say ran pretty smoothly so it's it's key that you have the right people with you from the very beginning yeah uh, and and uh, at parliamentics i mean for you uh, to enter this collaboration uh, what about your team did you have uh, everything in place to to have uh, this and did it change your business model or how you worked in some way um yeah i, I mean all all that we do and we are very broad so we we can um, one day we help e-commerce, the other day we help uh, cities and, and governments and so on. So we, we are very broad, but the, the common uh, denominator here is that a well-defined uh, critical question. Uh, I mean, all change begins with, with understanding. And I, I, I would say that uh, this was crystal clear. Uh, and then it's easy for us to team up, put a, uh, an analyst on this and, and to just roll out the project. And uh, we learned that, uh, I mean, we could apply this for other cities as well. Uh, it's a very uh, neat solution to understand commuting, understand whatever in your city. So we, that opened the door for us uh, because prior to this, we were mo mainly into the more digital sector. And uh, speaking about uh, transforming democracy, I know that we have a startup up in Umeå, uh, Ver AI, uh, and we have Andreas uh, on a link from Zoom. Uh, do you have any questions for, for Yuan or Yuan uh, to address uh, your point of view of uh, what we have heard so far? First, thank you for inviting me. Actually, when you first invited me, I was afraid that I wouldn't have a question to ask. Now I have too many questions, and I think you mind this is probably harder. Um, maybe I can. I would really love to know how did you change your if you have changed your business model or practices now that you're working with a much more public uh, organization instead of um, uh, pri more private businesses that you did in the past. If, if, if the fact that now you are dealing with public data for a public organization with potentially very great effects to the whole community, if that changes your practice and perspective of how you deal with uh, trustworthy AI issues. Good question, uh, Yuan at Parliamentics. Did you uh, did you copy that question? Have you changed your business model uh, or your way of approaching uh, when you are working with the public sector instead of the private sector? Um, no, the, the only thing uh, is is to have um, maybe the longer perspective. I mean, the, the the this will take some time, but it's definitely worth it. I mean, it, it we started talking the summertime, and then in maybe October, we had the final delivery. So, but that's okay if you just have that mindset. It it will not be as fast moving as as the private sector. But otherwise, I would say uh, we did not change our business model. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and I, I think, uh, Andreas, you will also be available for... Um, did you have one more question? One short one. We can address one more. Uh, otherwise, I will have you in the chat, maybe. Uh, and I know that ethics are important for you and uh, uh, ethical AI. Uh, so if you have a question for that, you can address to Andreas in the chat. Uh, we have to round up this conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Yuan and Yuan uh, from Uppsala and Parliamentary.
Matrix. And uh, looking forward to hear more about your work uh, later on. Thank you so much. Let's move on to more interaction. We actually have polls going up, and uh, it's important to, for us to have you participate here in, uh, in the schedule. And uh, if you look to your right, you have polls, and you will have different questions coming up. And feel free to answer any questions you want in the chat room as well. Uh, and we are ready to go into our next uh, phase of uh, uh, maybe having even more of a competition here. We have a global AI startup pitch contest coming up soon. But before that, uh, I would like to see if we have anything on the chat going on. Uh, we have the poll, uh, so feel free to go into uh, the poll asking question. And uh, if we look at that uh, right now, we have uh, a question, what are startups looking for from a collaboration with corporate? and you have different alternatives going on there. Is it to find potential acquirers, uh, land new enterprise customers, validate business idea, proof of concept, develop strategic partnership, access markets, validation of my products, recruit new investors, scout for talent. So uh, the collaboration with corporates, answer that questions in the poll. And we have some discussion going on in the chat about uh, how it is to work with the public sector, that it might take too long time to get in there. But we actually have seen in Ignite that there are some really quick results going on. So uh, let's move on to our global AI startup pitch contest. Actually, we are having all countries going on from nominating one startup. They have filmed their pitch and which will follow shortly. The first round of the pitches with the participants of these startups, Spark Beyond from Israel, Detonics from South Korea and Blinking from Germany. I would hope that we could have some sharing from these countries in the chat room as well. Are you ready for uh, the pitch? I am. Let's move on to our global pitch competition. What if we can build an aviation machine, an hypothesis generating engine, that whenever the client tells us what he's trying to solve, predict, explain, or shape, we can run in every possible direction. See things that no human eye can see, connect in a way that no human brain can connect, and take the client data as is, even if it's imperfect or incomplete, and then connect it to everything else which exists out there. If it's news, or weather, or Wikipedia, or open street map, you know, anything which is relevant to specific domain. So what we got is really the ability to generate millions and millions of ideas, rank it based on a strength, and then serve it not as a black box, but actually as a glass box, and therefore empower their ability to deal with bigger problems, faster decision making, way greater amount of data, and everything is evidence-based. We encourage our clients and partners to find a noble cause that we can jointly attack and generate social impact on top of the business impact. Hi, I'm Nora, I'm from Detonic. So the amount of data in the world is rapidly increasing and over 80% is spatial temporal big data. We at Detonic we're a big data company specializing in treating spatial temporal data efficiently. Through our engineering platform, GeoHiker, we help our clients to optimize their existing big data systems to process spatial temporal data more efficiently. Through applications, our clients have been able to see 5,000% cost savings and system speed increase by 40 times to enable real-time analytics no matter the size of the data. We have experience in various different industries, including smart city and future mobility, doing things like pollution analysis from drone data and contact tracing for COVID-19. And now we're ready for international expansion. Thank you. That's Tonic Data with the Tonic.
Imagine you could fix your car when you have a breakdown. Imagine you knew what any error code meant. Imagine you could build furniture without forgetting a screw. A dream, right? Actually, a reality. Blinkin gives you superpowers. We empower you to understand and solve problems, remotely and visually. Our first product, a video collaboration platform, transforms how people work together. People can chat, talk, and do a video call on a single link click and share their knowledge. But what if a company's best support agent was actually available anytime and to everyone at the same time? Meet Houston, our visual bot. Houston is our second product and it will be the visual digital assistant on your smartphone. It empowers you to understand any technical problem and to solve it on your own. With Blinkin, we are giving the world a help button. Thank you so much for that. We have actually two more rounds to go. And of course, the prize ceremony at the end of the program. And you will have the opportunity to vote as well. Uh, I think many of us are more curious about the startup as well. And uh, you will have the opportunity to meet them more, discuss with them, uh, share knowledge, networks, and maybe help them in some way during our coffee break, or as we say in Sweden, fika. And this is not a common fika. We do fika in Sweden with uh, coffee black and a cinnamon bun, uh, but this time we will do it with uh, the startups. Uh, you will have these different sessions to choose from, where you can enter uh, to your left and to chat with the startups that you just heard, heard pitching. But what about the culture? We know that culture is important, and uh, when you are doing business with other countries, it's important to know a certain thing. And the fika is important in Sweden. We do it several times a day. And uh, coffee, I don't know about you, but it has to be strong and black for me. And we have to have some energy. So feel free now to have a 15 minutes coffee break, fika, here in Sweden. Uh, and uh, we'll meet E again in 15 minutes sharp, because that is also a thing with us Swedes. We want to be punctual. So see you back here on the live stage in 15 minutes. Enjoy your break. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice fika with some new interaction and met some interesting people, maybe creating some new business uh, thoughts or interactions. So we are moving on to our track number two, Transforming Energy. We will listen to a collaborative story from EBM and Greenalytics. Let's go. Low-carbon exponential technologies, such as wind and solar energy, are rapidly getting deployed, decarbonizing the power grid. However, being weather-dependent, they add intermittency, making it a challenge to match instantaneous supply and demand. This is the last disadvantage of renewable energy, and we at Greenlytics are working towards tackling this challenge. Uncertainty in power production and consumption is one of the key factors holding back accelerated integration of renewable energy into the power system. Greenlytics is providing tools for forecasting and optimization based on machine learning to control tomorrow's distributed and dynamic energy system. This is done by unlocking latent value in weather, market and asset data, transforming it into actionable insights. That's exactly what Greenlytics is about. In 2019, we launched the Greenlytics platform. Our platform delivers an automated machine learning based forecasting engine that generates value within minutes. With just a few clicks, all components are connected, configured, and customized to deliver state-of-the-art wind, solar, consumption, and other energy-related forecasts. We put a very high value on our customers' time, and we strive to minimize the setup and maintenance without any compromise on accuracy or reliability. 
In 2019, we reached a point in our startup journey where we had validated our solution in several corporate pilots. We were ready to commercialize and scale our business offering in Sweden and beyond to the European market. When we met IBM, we were happy with our former cloud provider, one of the most recognized in the market. But as part of becoming enterprise ready at scale, allowing our customers to rely on analytics every day for their data and forecasting needs, we had a look at IBM Cloud. And now, having migrated to IBM since a few months back, we can't believe we didn't consider them in the first place. We assume migrating our entire compute stack to IBM Cloud would be a challenging task, but good documentation and tools have simplified the process to an extent where we felt comfortable with our choice. We have now a robust and secure platform to meet the availability demands from our current and future corporate clients. We see several synergies in joining the IBM startup ecosystem, leveraging their data, tools for machine learning and optimization engine. Greenlytics is on a mission, and we have now the backing and tech of IBM to increase the pace of change to a sustainable energy future. Sustainability, well, a focus we all need to have right now. And I'm so looking forward to dive deeper into this story from IBM and Greenalytics. And with me, I have Sebastian and Urban. A warm welcome to you. Thank you. Hi, Maria. Nice Thank to be you. Here. Thank you for being here in person as well. That's really nice. And uh, so. <laughs> I always love to hear how you met, but let's start with another question this time. Sebastian, can you tell me, as a startup, who are your customers? Absolutely. So I usually say that our vision is to empower tomorrow's energy innovators. So uh, everyone that's an energy innovator, we believe, is the companies that are driving uh, the energy system to become more sustainable. So these are our customers, and especially, especially we're targeting uh, energy aggregators, so startups, uh, as well as energy traders. So uh, a couple of our customers, for example, is Bixia and Tiber. So, but when you met IBM for the first time, how long ago was that? Um, that was back, um, must be one and a half year ago now, I guess. I think it was uh, September uh, at the Ignite event at Sting. Mm -hmm. So September 2019, I think. So, so what about your business and your business model? Has, has it changed? Yes, it has changed indeed. So um, basically what we have learned um, from uh, this past time is that we kind of um, taking a step back a little bit in our business model and really focusing on being developer first. Mm -hmm. so we see the energy innovators as our as a target customer group and our early adopters, and then we really need to make the tools and the data that we have available to them in a format that they really can, uh, can accept it and, and, and drive the innovation in their companies. And uh, what about IBM? In that journey, uh, how... Uh has they helped you? Yeah, good question. So, so I think about it like this. So the collaboration that we have done with IBM is really threefold. So, so the first part is what you saw in the video and in, in becoming enterprise ready and really be, being a stamp that, that we had a kind of an audit and a, and a second opinion on, on our code base so that we are robust and we can uh, supply to our customers. But on the other hand, it's also about business. Uh, so we have worked together with Urban and, and, uh, and his team on actually getting a se second opinion on our business model mm. and being able to help us in, in pivoting and, and finding our way as a startup. Mm. And the last part then is the collaboration with, uh, with other business units within I IBM. Mm. And for IBM, why are you getting involved with, with the startups as Greenalytics? Yeah, it's a good question. And before you get uh, the m more sensible answer, it's just so fun to work with teams like uh, Sebastian. It's, uh, I mean, on a personal note, it's the most fun I've been doing since I graduated from, from school, right? So I think that we shouldn't forget that. And I think that's yeah. a smile on your face. And I mean, that smile on my, puts a smile on my face on like every, every Monday morning, as well as from the team that I am fortunate to, to work with at IBM in our accelerated team. I mean, it's... When we reviewed, that was the sort of the driving passion. Nobody got assigned to work with this. Everybody volunteered uh -huh. and did it maybe part-time to, to begin with and then uh, got a, an opportunity to work with it more full-time, like my, myself. Mm. So, but from, from a business perspective, it's also, I would say, uh, three things. So we want to be, continue not just to work with 
uh, the industry leaders of today, but also be relevant to the industry leaders of tomorrow. Mm. And, and doing that by paying forward our own like, hard-earned lessons and sharing our, our, uh, our network. Mm. Number two, we want to create partners for the future, especially in the areas like in the industry verticals where we are already present. So we want to be able to push those uh, forward as well. And thirdly, we want to complement our own offering. So it's been much talk in terms of the why for, for, for corporates to engage, but also to complement our own innovation offer um, out to our existing corporate clients. Um, so that's really an important thing to us, to meet them where they are. And right now, many of those are uh, working together with you guys. Mm. And that's a part that we're working with actually quite a lot right now, the complementary aspects, both in terms of technology and business modeling. And, and I'm looking forward to, to work more on that going forward. So you have some more. Uh, that was my next question. What about the future? Yeah. How the, what, can you start, Urban, the future for you? What's yeah, the next I mean, step? My, my hopes is exactly as, as, as Sebastian was alluding to, we have a Danish uh, product in, in particular, Denmark, having almost 50% of their uh, energy production coming from wind. And, and they don't have hydro or nuclear to, to, uh, to rely on. So as it's so cyclic in terms of the production as well as the consumption, you need some way to balance that out. And in Denmark, IBM has teamed up together with a DSO, a network pro provider, and are now have developed a flex platform, just like you're talking about. So aggregating commercial buildings, spare capacity, forecasting when it can be made available, and then uh, offer that back as balance capacity on the spot market. Mm. And uh, companies like, uh, like Sebastian's are, are great additions to that and can really, so that mix, challenging the incumbents, mm. of that mix of, of young energy as well as great talent together with sort of some, some rigid uh, tech and, and business in the background, I think can really push us forward. And it's that kind of initiatives that really I see as being the energy innovators of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So this kind of flex pa platform that Urban talked about uh, and what we want to do is provide them with the best data and tools so that they can succeed in their turn. So for example, we're looking into providing data from, from assets, sharing uh, more data within the industry, as well as providing our data when it comes to uh, weather data or other parameters. And now you have a golden opportunity. You know, we have a big audience. Do you have any call to action to, we can use the chat, or I mean, uh, they can find you on LinkedIn. Uh, what do you want for the future? What kind of connections or network do you want to get oh, into? It's a great opportunity. Thank you so much for <laughs> that. Uh, so, and also putting me a little bit on the spot. I need to think, I think. So, so really, I mean, I'm, I'm really for, you know, tomorrow's, um, uh, data economy where we can share data more. We just talked about this before uh, going on stage here, that data is not shared to the extent that it, that it should be. Uh, and I think that that's especially true for, for old and kind of, uh, um, uh, kind of conservative industries like energy industry or public sector. So, so, so I'm happy to talk and, and network with anyone that, that, that uh, kind of this resonates with and, and that's also think about data sharing and, uh, and, and, and collaboration around data. And I mean, uh, it's so interesting to hear from you, Urban, about the, the passion and the energy air that you get internally. What about the culture of innovation at IBM? H has it changed since you, since you started working with startups uh, more? Yes, I think it's changed a lot. I've been with the company for, for 10 years. I work for a software company, that, a Swedish one, actually, that got acquired. So I think I've seen uh, quite a bit of changes. And I think that the last five years or so, I mean, we're on a path where um, pretty much everything we do is, is uh, open sourced. So either we contribute or we initiate. Um, so, um, and I think that's the path forward if you want to create critical mass around every, anything that you want to do that can really have an impact. So I think that's also the message we give with, to, to most of our startups that we engage with is that, uh, yeah, it's great you want to conquer the world, but how are you going to get there yeah. and just get the attention to do it? So having open source as part of the strategy which Sebastian and team uh, really does have. So, so I think that's uh, an important part. And, and since we um, sort of really went all way and paid tons of money um, in order to, to acquire Red Hat, which was sort of the starting point with Linux, uh, sort of the starting point um, of uh, the open source movement, 
So from that on, that has just accelerated our own uh, sort of journey towards working in open um, uh, communities, mm -hmm. contributing, and that just goes so well hand in hand with working with um, also startups. And that's also where we kind of share our, our vision, I believe. We have been working now on a, uh, on a research project founded by the Swedish Energy Agency um, that has been going on for, for several years. And we've been developing a lot of machine learning code and data analytics. And we now take the decision to actually open source many of these algorithms on our GitHub repo. Mm. So, so that's also something that we really want to drive as the um, as, as, as the kind of uh, driving force in our company to, to, to be open, to be collaborative. Yeah. And I uh, if I can complement on your call to action, I think, I mean, um, uh, talk to Sebastian and teams, and we can also so, sort of have a conversation uh, with us at IBM and Red Hat in terms of just sharing our views on what does it take in order to be more open mm -hmm. and to be able to share data and, and to work in that collaborative fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a journey many companies need to, or many have already started, but I think more needs to go more all in mm. on that in order to um, stay afloat and, and really be top of the, the, the curve going forward. But it looks like so, w when I see you discussing with each other and I see the energy, was it any challenges during the way or has it always went smooth and uh, happy and... Uh, Everything was always smooth, yeah, uh, <laughs> of <always>. course. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, I, I think that there has to be like, uh, you know, honest about that. It's, there's uh, always challenges in like yeah. working with uh, small and, and, and large. This has been a, a collaboration where we actually, um, it feels a little bit like, like Urban and, and the gang from the, from the IBM Startup Accelerator is kind of a startup itself. Yeah. So we are kind of on, on a, like level, uh, eye level with them. Um, uh, but of course, then when it comes to collaborative, finding synergies, then you have, you have to, you know, make your way forward. And, and that's always a, a, a tricky thing that you, I mean, uh, but can be overcome. Mm. And from your perspective? Yeah, in, in my case, I think that, uh, I mean, we had a very open dialogue to begin with. I mean, we start off, um, every, um, one, once we have passed uh, sort of the hurdle of the introduction and the assessment that we feel that we have a mutual. So we, we put a plan in place where we, where we try to put in writing. And I think with Sebastian and team, it was an early draft of that. Uh, now we've sort of progressed in terms of having more formal uh, documents in place, but really put down in the beginning. So I expect this from you and you expect this from, from us. Mm. And even though it's not legally binding, it's more like a morally binding rather mm. than anything else. Because mm. if you don't want to play anymore, I mean, <laughs> who's to keep you? Mm. Um, but um, having that in the beginning, you can always sort of revert back and, and yeah. rather have those um, uh, questions in the beginning yeah. uh, mm. when it's you're all uh, energized and you want to get started. Mm. Yeah. Completely agree on that. I mean, in any collaboration, I think expectations are, are key to, to mm. set that out uh, early and to understand each other's expectations. So what, what do you think about, is it anything you are, you mentioned the Swedish energy agency that you are doing a project, you are part of the ecosystem, I know, in different ways. Is it anything you're missing or anything you, you would like to highlight that has been a really nice collaboration? Because the theme is uh, collaboration, doing it together. Um, no, I mean, I, I think it's already been highlighted several times, but I will do it mm. one more time yeah. because uh, <laughs> because it really deserves it. And that's the, the Ignite uh, Sweden program. Yeah. So that's really helped us a lot with, you know, getting in contact with, with, with corporates, getting in contact with potential customers, potential partners like, mm. like Urban here. Uh, so that's really something I would like to highlight. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I can I can just agree. I mean, and and one of the few upsides with with this um, year of the COVID has been that Sweden has shrunk, mm. uh, really. So we can connect and we can be uh, on multiple places, and 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 really it doesn't matter if it's um, in Umeå or if it's in uh, down in uh, in um, in Skåne that we're uh, meeting uh, companies. Uh, everybody's on sort of like on the same. Same terms, mm. um, and we wouldn't have met Sebastian and the team if it weren't for for Ignite. So mm. really grateful. And uh, for everyone in the chat, uh, feel free to ask questions. We have time to uh, take some questions, and let's move on with the first one to Sebastian. Uh, how important has ABB and Synolib in his uh, to build the company been to where you are right now? IBM, I think they are addressing. <laughs> 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 IBM. Um, I mean, 
so uh, if, if you, I think it is uh, about building your company, and mm -hmm. from the start, has you grown? How big is the startup right now? So, so um, that's a good question. So, first of all, um, maybe I can say something about like incubators mm -hmm. and, and business yeah. coaches, and I and the kind of the vision that we have been taking in the company is that, uh, or the kind of guiding line that we've been taking is is maybe to get more perspectives and more eyes on what we're doing is always helpful. Yeah. Uh, so, so some people, they say, I used to have this business coach and I only go with this business coach because that's the best one. Mm. Uh, but I, I have a kind of opposite view there that uh, actually testing your business model with several ones is much better because you have much more insights and much more feedback on that. Mm. Um, so second part of the question, so how much have we grown? We actually, I mean, did a quite a, uh, quite a substantial uh, pivot. Uh, uh, now during 2020, mm. um, and we kind of been um, finding our way through uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, yeah. uh, and we're now coming out on the other side. I feel much better off, uh, and that is of course partially because of because of IBM mm. uh, and their feedback that they have given to our uh, business model. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, now we have some really long questions. Uh, let me see here. Uh, uh, if you could mention, uh, I think we will take this later on. Uh, what about your part in uh, growing uh, or seeing this company grow? Would you feel like, uh, uh, have you helped them in any way? You mentioned business co coaches as incubator. What about your role in that yeah. case, discussing we business models? I always like to do, I always question myself and think, <laughs> what could we do more? Yeah. Uh, and sort of going here and say that, yeah, I don't know what we've done. I mean, <laughs> they're so great on their own. Yeah. But um, I mean, um, to be serious, I think that, uh, I mean, we're working with four areas, right? Uh, and, and Sebastian, we're talking about, and I think we've covered uh, most of those. Um, uh, so we're not working maybe a little bit different than, and than other um, Ignite uh, corporations. So we're not after a project. We're after working with the company. Yeah. And so though, if the company pivots, then we try to sort of like roll with the punches and find new areas of how, how can we help in those. But mm -hmm. so the, f the four areas is really, I mean, that you were, um, Sebastian was alluding to. So something that we know, I mean, uh, to be accepted, not just as a startup or as a pilot bit, as a real uh, company and meeting the demands from both legal as well as IT office. So to, to work with that. Uh, secondly, to position yourself within an enterprise. We work with business development and sales towards large enterprises. We feel we have something to like, pay forward in that area. And then to offer, um, if, if, if not validation, because we like to at least feedback. So in the terms of the, the Danish Energy Flex platform, uh, so far they've gotten feedback. Mm. Uh, the difference between feedback and validation, money involved, Mm. That's validation. Yeah. The other is, is, uh, is an opinion or feedback, mm. but mm. it can be of various um, uh, value depending on who's, who's sending it. And, and, and fourthly, we, um, um, we also look to try to help them make, uh, break through uh, the noise in terms of marketing PR. Yeah. Um, and of course, we work with, with, with the business model and just try to give a second opinion, having worked with software licensing, working with uh, SaaS uh, business models and, and platforms. Um, we just want to, to, to share that. And that has been very appreciated. I mean, uh, what you said there before uh, about you know, the startup in, in your program, sitting in the driving seat, is mm. driving the car, but you know, you're, you're there behind, you're helping, you're mm. criticizing, you're coming with your input and feedback. That's, uh, that's important. And, and I think that's uh, so important that what you said, to, to get help from as many ways as possible. And uh, that comes up to uh, uh, the next question uh, that is actually about pitching. Uh, and we all know that uh, you are doing a lot of pitches as a startup. And uh, actually, we had a masterclass uh, business to business sales just before uh, this conference started. And it's, it's all for preparing the startups for tomorrow's meetings, because you have a lot of meetings tomorrow. Uh, uh, and uh, that is not about pitching. That is all about listening to the corporate's need. Uh, you say about 80% of listening and 20 about uh, talking. What about that first meeting? Can you tell us how you got the interest at IBM and how you sell uh, or tell instead of maybe pitch? 
uh, to the corporate. Yes, I mean, so, so what Urban said before is that uh, this um, collaboration that that, uh, that IBM is doing with Ignite is a little bit different from other yeah. other. Uh, so they're not coming there, you know, uh, searching for a solution, but they're searching for a for a company for yeah. a startup. Yeah. Uh, and there's really been, I mean, what I feel is important there is, 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 is chemistry, right? It's mm. really to feel like, you know, uh, we can do something together, they understand what we're working with, and that was really what I felt the first meeting, like, shit, oh, uh, they, they actually understand what we're doing, they kind of, they, 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 they talk the same language, they, yeah. they know about our space, and that was really, really cool for us to see. Uh, when it comes to you know uh, uh, not pitching in, in front of uh, customers, uh, I mean that's that's really uh, where where I've done a lot of mistakes and and I'm, I'm trying to learn every time. Uh, and it's really you know you need to bite your tongue not to not to come up with your solution and, yeah. and really to understand what they, they need and really to you know uh, double double click on on their pain and understanding that what is it that really that they're, they're after and making them you know express it for you and making them pitch uh, the solution instead of you. Yeah. yeah, good answer. And and I think we will round up with that because uh, that is what it's all about, the chemistry, right? You, you want to really feel that. Uh, the digital version of the meeting might be a bit, we have a filter with a screen in between, but I love to see the energy between you and uh, to hear about uh, what it has given you in the different values. So thank you so much for uh, being here with us today. And uh, do you have any meetings tomorrow, Sebastian? Yes, yeah, several. Yeah. I think you have seven meetings tomorrow. Yeah. So best of luck tomorrow mm. with all the meetings. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Maria. And uh, let's move on to our uh, next one, Global AI Startup Pitch Contest. And we have the second round of pitches with the participants from uh, Greater Than in Sweden, Rex from Brazil, and Artilus from India. I think we should share them on a bit more in the chat. So good luck to you guys. Hi, my name is Lislot Johansson. I'm the CEO of the award-winning InsurTech and AI company Greater Than. Our AI understands the predict risk of motor insurance in a better way than any other insurance company in the world. This revolutionizes how motor insurance works with risk, pricing and offering in a model that inspires and engages to safer driving and more eco-friendly way of driving with proven record of less road accidents and reduction of CO2 emissions with more than 20%. The service is used by auto and insurance giants from Japan through Asia, Europe and US. AI is a part of the climate solutions and we are leading it. Hello, my name is Fabiane Kuhn. I'm CEO of Hacks Agricultural Technology, a Brazilian startup. We developed a system to improve the irrigation control, and we have our own sensors to measure the soil moisture with the physical principle called TDR. The sensors stay fixed in the field with solar panels, and all the information is transmitted through wireless communication. So the farmer can see graphs, table and also configure the soil type and crop in our platform so they can see the right moment to start the irrigation process and with that we can help farmers to produce more food with less water less energy less pesticides and you can see all of that in our web page thank you so much Close to $9 trillion will be spent on healthcare in 2020. Over 3 billion people live with little to no healthcare in the world. The amount of money being set aside for the forgotten billion, no one knows, no one cares. There is a massive patient physician gap that is compounding this problem of uneven healthcare spending around the globe. Something has to be done to bring healthcare to them, and we at Artilus are on a mission to democratize healthcare for the forgotten billion. How do we plan to do this? 
By using state-of-the-art cutting-edge technology developed in our labs, using the latest advancements in deep learning and artificial intelligence, we plan to embark on a global screening campaign to screen all marginalized people, like the native Indian in the USA to the aborigines in Australia, and the Basi tribes in India to the people in Africa and South America. We will screen 100 million marginalized people for DR, glaucoma, and other diseases, and we hope to set into motion a chain reaction that will create an ecosystem where others like us will join the movement to screen for our abilities. The crazy people in Arcalus believe we can bring healthcare to the entire world using AI and other advances in technology. May this tiny spark set into motion a movement that will save millions and millions of lives through automated screening. Thank you so much for those three pitches from greater than Sweden, Rex, Brazil, and Artilos from India. And now it's time again to mingle with these startups. So you have the time of going into the sessions. And of course, Fika, remember the Swedish version of it, bring your coffee before you go into the session, maybe have a technical break. Uh, 15 minutes from now, sharp, we will be back here with our track number three. So enjoy your fika and see you soon. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice fika. Uh, I did go backstage to talk a little bit more about a startup that we recently heard, Greenalytics, Sebastian. And he told me, oh, maybe I should have uh, told them a little bit more about our pox that we had on our way and maybe sell myself more. And uh, I think that's interesting because that is also a cultural thing. Uh, and we are discussing that a lot in the workshops that our startups actually had previous uh, to this event and to prep them for their meetings tomorrow. And uh, if we just take a short glance back, we are now about to head into our third track, but we have two already. And we also heard six pitches. And these six pitches are from startups all over the world and are competing against each other for a really interesting prize at the end of this uh, day. And remember, you will be able to vote as well. So what about our next session? Uh, that is, uh, we mentioned this case earlier, that sometimes there is actually the need of more than two parties to collaborate. And in this one, we have three. So Transforming Industry, a collaborative story by Alpha Laval, Econo Solution and FLIR System. Let's see a movie about our track number three. So my name is Anders Almeng and I'm a co-founder of Econo Solutions and we do machine learning for IoT. So it's sort of like putting a brain into each machine or vehicle and make it uh, self-learning, self-adaptive and uh, context-aware. We had an idea about what we could do in theory and then what we have done is that we have uh, tried to prove that by practical tests. So this has been a very unique collaboration, three parties. We have Alpha Laval uh, bringing the domain knowledge to the table, FLIR bringing a specific temperature analysis from their thermal cameras, and us bringing it all together uh, with the edge uh, technology that we provide. One thing that was really good with the collaboration was that we got to work with Alpha Lavelle in their test lab, trying out the algorithms on actual machinery where they could induce fault faster, which is, is nice when you're that close to the industry that really develops it. We have had a few promising results also at customer sites. The impact of this uh, collaboration has been that we've been trying out our technology in real customer sites, which always give uh, data that you uh, couldn't expect and that you cannot reproduce in a lab. 
Fleer is a sort of mid-sized company, not huge, but not small. Uh, and we have sensing technology in world class, but in order for that sensing technology to provide the decision support in various of different markets, we want to engage more to add that intelligence into our systems. And we think startups is a really way, good way of doing that. Okay, we can see. Ah, here we can spot a heat exchanger with a small mobile held camera. It is not very good, the picture, because we don't have any temperature. It's a plastic mock-up. The dynamic between the three companies have been quite open. I think that the people that have been involved are people that are used to work in this kind of approach, agile approach. I mean, not being too strict on or having a too detailed plan from the beginning. So I think the interaction between us has been quite nice in that sense. It's been a very open dialogue. And also the fact that we maybe made a homework before with good um, agreements on, a legal, on legal terms so that we could speak quite openly when we talk to each other. So the, the result of the collaboration is sort of a lot of things. One thing is to collaborate three parties, which uh, when you're collaborating two parties has its own challenges, but doing it with three is, is even more complicated. Uh, and what's been very fruitful in this collaboration is that all three parties have actually put in a lot of time and resource to, to get to a good result. So we've done everything from lab testing together, all the three of us, to actually try testing this out in a real uh, environment with the customer. And this has taken a lot of, uh, uh, our great strength as three companies to bring this all together. So the collaboration has been really good. So, three parties, is that even more challenging? Uh, let's meet uh, Anders from Econo, Anders from Alfa Laval, and Katrin from FLIR. Maybe my challenge will be to try to uh, go from uh, one Anders to the other. So I will start by my first question to Katrin. Uh, and uh, to listening to your story, and uh, Katrin, you told me about a aha moment that you have. Can you tell us more about how you met? Yes. So a little bit of background. FLIR was hosting an innovation challenge uh, in uh, about a year ago, where we have posted one of our biggest challenges for the future, which is that we uh, thermal cameras can be used in condition monitoring applications of machinery since faults often tend to generate heat. We posted that problem to our startups, but also explained that today's situation, these faults are found with a specialist the camera and that specialist need to know how to interpret the data. So we sat there in the jury room, we posted the problem and Econo came in and they got completely understood the task at hand. So they suggested we use their machine learning in putting our sensor data into that to actually monitor the condition of a heat exchanger. And I think this was an aha moment because they were already in a collaboration with Alpha Laval. And I remember our general manager who was in the jury of that meeting saying that like, this is fantastic. We've been talking about thermal for heat exchanger for the past 10 years, thinking there's huge potential there, but never really like doing anything about it. And suddenly there's this startup here that knows the company that want to do a joint project. Uh, and we actually have Alpha Laval in the project. And I think it paid off from start, as we said in the video, being, uh, if you're going to do condition monitoring in heat exchangers, being with a company that knows everything about them, that has developed them, uh, we could be in their labs doing testing and things like that was really paying off from start. Thank you, Katrin. And, and uh, it's so interesting to hear because in the chat as well, uh, we can feel that this is for real. You actually had that aha moment and it kind of gives me goosebumps when I think about that moment. Uh, and uh, 
a match made in heaven, Anders at Econo. Was it the same feeling for you in that your room? Oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I might have to say that I'm envious of Sebastian, who managed to be there with you on stage. Oh. But I'll have to settle for this. Uh, yeah, for us, it was extremely rewarding to uh, work with uh, two companies, best of breed in fluid handling, such as Alfa Laval, with the heat exchanger in this case, and uh, the market-leading thermal cameras from, from FLIR. And yeah, I see that as the match made in heaven. If you just look at the name, uh, heat exchanger, thermal camera, that's a ma match made in heaven for sure. Uh, and adding uh, Econos uh, Edge machine learning to these the capabilities of actually taking the data from the camera, looking at the heat exchanger, and then correlate that data cr to create something that we call a virtual sensor uh, that can then tell you the actual uh, health values of that particular uh, heat exchanger at any given time, obviously paves the way to doing uh, some, some really interesting things such as uh, predictive maintenance, order tuning, uh, and a wealth of other things that you can do with edge machine learning. Uh, so the heat exchanger actually becomes context aware, which is, is really cool. But I think the beauty also, as, as Katrin said, of this uh, particular project was that it was not just a gang of three who was working together, but Alfa Laval were nice enough to invite a customer to the, to the group as well. So we managed not only to test this in a lab environment, which uh, is good, but we also managed to test this uh, with a real customer. Uh, and the wealth of information that we got from that and the knowledge we got from that, I think is really valuable now moving uh, the steps ahead. Uh, thank you, Anders. And uh, what about uh, your value of this collaboration, Anders, for, on Alpha Laval? Can you tell us more about your story? Yes, I mean, <clears throat> Katrin mentioned that uh, um, it's uh, normally you need an operator to interpret what uh, an IR camera is seeing. And we have used those types of cameras in our labs and at customers for decades, maybe. But with the possibility to find a way to doing that with machine learning in an automated way, would open a lot of opportunities. I mean, we have more than a million installed heat exchangers in our customer database, etc. So I mean, there is a huge potential to dig from. Um, yeah. And uh, could you have you seen any unexpected values with it, this collaboration? Any new business opportunities or in the sustainability field? Can you tell us more about uh, that? I mean, one typical parameter which Anders also was into is that heat exchangers are used everywhere and they get fouled from different debris over time and you lose energy efficiency and just the value of that. I mean, there are studies saying that about 2% of the world CO2 is wasted by running heat exchangers that are foul. So if we can get closer to that and address more heat exchangers and users of them in order to clean them in the right time, it's a huge potential of savings and uh, uh, thank you and uh, for me it's it sounds like the match made in heaven and that aha moment was it any difficulties in this collaboration or was everything going really smooth from the start uh katrin what do you say i think it went very smoothly i, I think we came to an agreement quite quickly and i think you have to be open to engaging in an agreement, knowing that the partnership in itself is more important than that everything is to your benefit on every line in an agreement. The intention of the collaboration is more important than the exact agreement. And I think we all had that mindset going into this collaboration. And, and for you, Anders at Econo, how has it changed uh, for your startup, has has it grown? Has you changed any new field that you are working with? Can you tell us more about your journey? Well, we've grown quite a bit, but um, obviously COVID has come in the way of, of growing as much as we would have wanted to. In in some of the new things for us was obviously using thermal camera technology to actually use that as an intelligence sensor. We had not done that before, and that uh, opened up a lot of new possibilities for us uh, on how to use that technology. I think also 
when it comes to using edge machine learning, uh, the brilliance of that is that it, it doesn't have any preconceived ideas of what it will actually find. So we'll, it will find what it actually finds. And in the end of the day, in almost any project, you will find things that you didn't expect it uh, that can explain things that you may, might have not known before. So that's always rewarding. I think we have that in the in this project as well. But I think working in this tight group and actually seeing how these two companies who are quite used to working with startups, uh, so they put the right resources when it comes to product management and all of that, and also see the next step as, as um, uh, putting it uh, in production. So, so I think they have the right mindset and that helps a lot when they want to collaborate. Yeah, uh, I was just going to uh, say that about the open mindset that I feel that all you three have and uh, the resources, of course. But I'm curious about the time frame, Anders at Alfa Laval. Can you tell us from your first meeting, just to briefly go through the project, how long time did it take to, to get where you are right now? And where are you right now? Uh, well, this specific project, I think we had a quite quick start together. I mean, we understood each other. And we, as Andres also said there, we are people involved that are quite used to working this agile approach without necessarily having to know exactly where we are heading when we started, but we had an idea. And I think the theoretic models and uh, thoughts about what we could achieve was accomplished maybe in two or three weeks. And then we did some first lab tests in our own lab, but they do not reflect the normal conditions. Of course, the lab is not working like that, the customer. So the bigger challenge was to find a suitable test installation where you had some type of change of the working conditions of a heat exchanger in, in a time that you could monitor over a shorter period. So maybe that took six months before we had those results. And then the interpretation was quite quick again. So, yeah. But that's... Had to wait for some... Yeah. That sounds amazing, and then you get a lot of shares in the chat. Uh, and uh, repeat what was said yesterday, 10% uh, is AI, 20% tech, and 70% is the people. And I think all of you three shows that it's all about the people uh, being open-minded and uh, having a passion about solving uh, this. And what about solving, if we look into the global goals and uh, sustainability, we discussed that a bit. Uh, can you tell us more, Anders, at Alpha Laval, about uh, the global goals and how you connect with the, the future? Yeah, well, Alpha Laval has a quite nice situation in the way that we are, of course, with energy and energy efficiency, and it applies to maybe most industries. And then we have the other terms as well with uh, food and water, which I mean, I think we, is it the 17 goals? I think we are actively working with at least 15 of them we can, yeah, so. It's a very important part for us. Mm. It's nice also to have another purpose and only to make, I mean, it's business, but it's also nice that the business has a purpose above that. Of course. And, and uh, for you, uh, Katrin, uh, how do you work with sustainability and the global goals? So uh, there's, uh, the cameras can be used for various things. I mean, in this application, we use uh, them to make sure the condition of the heat exchanger is, is efficient enough, but uh, cameras can also be used since heat generation where you don't want it is typically an energy consumer that you don't want in your systems and something that's not good for the environment. So any heat we can find in, in all systems that generate it uh, is good. Uh, I can talk forever, but our cameras also see like methane ga gas, which is an important part in, in reducing the greenhouse gases and finding leaks. Thank you. And uh, uh, one question from uh, the chat here uh, about the timing to start this collaboration. Uh, could you say anything about that, the timing for you as a corporate, I mean, uh, we could hear for you, Katrin, that you had this uh, challenge. Uh, can you tell us more about the timing? Was it anything was just uh, that match made in heaven or the perfect time? What do you say about that? Katrin, you can start. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I think the timing for us was really good. And I want to say something more on this. I think this collaboration to some extent then change our strategy because the value in having someone that 
could add decision support like like Anders at Econo and having also worked directly with the machinery that we tried to figure out the condition of was so valuable. So there are a lot more words in our strategy around partnerships than it was previous to this collaboration. Yeah. Mm. Interesting, and I, I know that there are many of these unexpected meetings uh, when we, what we do at Ignite. It's not about having that clear strategy, what kind of startup to meet, but it can shift. You have to be really open-minded. Uh, and for you, Anders at Alfa Laval, how was it for the timing for you? Was it important that this was just the right time? I mean, we are just in the middle of this connectivity work to connect our products and create business and uh, value around that. And I mean, finding a new way of creating a sensor from an IR camera, that is a perfect match in time for the, I mean, we are in the acceleration phase offering. So that was a perfect timing for that. Then of course the scale up is what is a bit more time consuming and that's about to come, I hope. Mm. And uh, one more, I mean, uh, you mentioned the intentions, and I will continue with you, Anders, at Alfa Laval. Uh, you, you get a lot of cheers. Congrats to your excellent collaboration. And uh, can you share something about intellectual properties in another way? Was, was it any discussions there or any agreements uh, in the beginning of the collaboration? I think, um, and, and I guess hopefully also, uh, we are... I mean, the people involved are quite used to to um, work in a little bit more pr pragmatic way and having prepared templates, etc., to do agreements covering what is necessary, not trying to cover. I mean, we have not been talking about business model or royalties or anything like that and trying to do agreements around that. We have been focused on well, what kind of information we have to exchange in order to do a pilot, and then the next has to come after that. So mm. that, that pragmatic approach helped to speed up. Otherwise, we could have been waiting for months just to get the Signature yeah, I can see that. Katrin, do you have anything to comment on that? Yeah, I, yeah, I think we had that approach as well. And we typically, I mean, we have very different products. <laughs> the heat exchangers and the thermal cameras are completely different things. So I think if you are willing to stick to your expertise and the IP that's close to your stuff, and that the other part have the IP that's close to their stuff. Of course, there could be something in the middle, but in general, that is a good rule of thumb uh, that helps uh, in this uh, process. Thank you. And uh, my last question goes to you, Anders, at Econo. Uh, of course, you know, I, I love to help startups to grow. And so what's your call to action now when you have hundreds of people all around the world looking at you? Uh, is it any networks you want to reach out to, contacts, anything else that you want to have the final words? Well, I mean, we have a really ambitious plan moving forward. We uh, are absolutely certain that the uh, machine, edge machine learning will play a vital part in industry moving forward in dig digitalization. And we, uh, we have the goal of being the, uh, uh, the, the leader in that. So, so anyone who has a challenge with that, they can definitely uh, call us and we will be happy to, to help them with that uh, uh, task. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much, and congrats, and you will, you, as I mentioned, get a lot of shares at the chat for a great collaboration and an interesting story. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, thank you for uh, asking questions in the chat and feel free to share your contacts, your LinkedIn uh, and uh, share with my colleague Linus uh, what you need. And we will try to do a lot of matches, uh, as many as we can. But let's move on to our third and final round of the startup pitches. So the last round of our pitches, uh, we have these startups coming up. Quam from France, uh, Sainar from US, and Cold Start from Canada. And I hope you are ready to share them on and are focused on listening to their pitches. Here we go.
Perhaps you are dealing with a large number of unstructured text documents such as emails, contracts, reports, surveys, and you don't know how to make the most of it. Quant specializes in retrieving and analyzing textual data from your document management applications, from your business solutions, from the web, or wherever it might come from. We offer automated processes to analyze textual data with deep learning solutions to give you insights from large number of text documents to enable such applications so that the right information is made available to the best person for decision making. I don't know Quam, why would I ask for your solutions when I can call these big companies, you know? Quam is a French company with more than 10 years of experience and all of the solutions are hosted in France and respect the European policy so your data is safe. Also, Quam works hand in hand with its customers. Our solutions are adaptable. We won't provide you with a black box. Let's get in touch and see how we can work together to improve your textual data. Hi, I'm Danny, CEO of Zyner, where we do submeter 3D location tracking. Isn't it ridiculous that more than a decade after the smartphones come out, we still don't have accurate location in cities and indoors? How is it that we still can't precisely track assets in factories and warehouses? Well, GPS solutions aren't strong enough to penetrate indoors or in dense areas, and beacon solutions have a host of issues that just aren't scalable. We have solved the location problem, and thanks to breakthroughs in timing and signal processing, we can now put you on the second floor in conference room B. I know that engine part you're looking for is 13.2 meters to your right. And we've got the team to do it with former head of hardware at the world's largest GPS company, the former lead engineer of the world's top performing GPS company, and engineering gurus out of Stanford and MIT. We're currently working with the world's largest warehouser. We've got $20 million in LOIs and have raised roughly $7 million from tier one investors. And industry leaders are already raving about us. So if you want to learn more, reach out to me at info at zynertech.com. I'm Sean O'Brien, one of the founders of Goldstar. In 2020, your customers expect personalization. They'll spend more, more frequently, and engage deeper when you provide an individual experience. When you don't, they'll become frustrated and leave. We provide best-in-class personalization by integrating our product directly into your mobile and digital channels. It's AI-powered, and we do all the heavy lifting, collecting millions of data elements and applying dozens of machine learning models, giving you true one-to-one -one user insights on their behavior, lifestyle, and motivations for you to power truly magical digital experiences. You'll be able to generate increased ad revenue, improve your affiliate marketing, and drive new strategic partnerships with your increased knowledge of your customers, as well as saving millions in technology costs and getting an ROI from your machine learning in weeks instead of years or never. The best part is, it's GDPR compliant. Come join us and create a best-in-class digital experience for your customers. Thank you so much. And that was our last three pitches for today. So we have nine startups that we are about to vote for soon. Uh, you will get all the information after our next FICA. Because it's time for our last FICA for today. I hope you have the cinnamon bun ready uh, and the coffee. Or if you want to grab something else, that's fine as well. Uh, but remember, in the session rooms, I saw that there was a lot of things going on there. So if you are interested in the uh, startups uh, remember to use the sessions and find that startup that you are interested in and uh, thank you so much for being a part of the chat continue to ask questions let us know what you need and we are happy to help you in the best way we can so are we ready for 15 minute sharps maybe 14 and a half now uh, fika and let's see you here again for our final track deep dive into a case of how we transform safety thank you so much Welcome back. We are up for our fourth session here. 
and it's all about to transform safety. But before that, we heard nine interesting startup pitches, and it's actually time to vote. So go into the polls to the right and vote for your startup. And I hope that all countries are now really hanging in there and voting for their startup or the startup that you feel are most interesting. I saw in the chat that there were also some questions if the startups could share their pitches. So I guess there were some really interesting ones going on there. And we also got an interesting question about how far did they go with the pilot or where are the pilot from our last session with Alpha Laval, Econo and FLIR. And uh, what I know is that Alpha Laval and Econo has already projects that are rolled out to commercial and global market. So things are happening for real here and uh, we were super excited to hear their story. But I'm really excited to dive into the next one as well. We are about to uh, talk about transforming safety and listen to a collaborative story by ABB and Universes. And uh, ABB and Universes has the aim to transform safe safety within the mining industry. And I think we start by having some movie time. Let's roll the movie. Universus is part of the Cineleap uh, program here at ABB and through that we met some people from the mining department at ABB uh, and they had a particular problem with uh, a project that they were working on. Uh, this was the Sims project uh, and they were trying to make a robot charge a mine wall with explosive. Uh, the particular problem that they had was to give that robot perception capability. Universus develops perception software that's typically deployed in systems like autonomous driving uh, and robotics in the warehouse. Uh, and this is particularly exciting for a small company like Universus to be able to do this type of adaptation because it opens up new markets and it allows for a small company to work with larger companies like ABB. A robot needs to find the real holes in the face. It does that uh, with the vision system. It identifies all the drilled holes within the scanning area and finally calculates how many of them that are possible to reach and charge. Next step is to start charging operation of the first hole by getting a detonator cassette from the detonator magazine. Then the primer together with the detonator is flipped around and attached to the end of the charging hose. And the charging head is then moved to the position of the first hole and the charging hose is pushed inside the bottom of the drilled hole. The latest from the project is that the, uh, the decision has been made to move forward to try and develop a prototype system. Uh, the proof of concept enabled us to prove the technology to demonstrate that using this approach, uh, the technical solution would enable the capability that was desired. And so now we're moving forward with the development of a prototype to deploy in a mine in future. Thank you so much. And I'm so curious to dive deeper into your story. A warm welcome to Martin from Sunali, powered by ABB, and from Jonathan from Universes. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Maria. Thank you very much for having me. So happy to have you here. So let's, I have to have that first question again, Martin. How did it all start? How did it all start? <laughs> First of all, uh, you saw in the video here about the mining project. It started actually for one and a half year ago when Universes joined Synlip, ABB's accelerator for startups. We were match made together with uh, Ignite Sweden and they found an excellent startup working with computer vision, machine learning. And we run a small project together with a mobile robotics and AGV targeting uh, actually Houston Hospital in US. And that was an excellent project. Universes showed that agility, their, their flexibility, their professionalism in computer vision. And then we said back, hey, we must showcase these for ABB people. We are 100,000 people. We are 50,000 projects. We are in 100 countries. 
and we're starting to to um, invite them for for small pitches all over the places. And we come to one meeting, which I remember as it was yesterday. It was one year ago. You were sitting together, Jonathan and, and the team, together with the mining people expertise. And something happened on that meeting. It was more that I saw that something triggered in Jonathan's team. And after that meeting, we understood that these guys, they know computer vision, but we don't really know where to use them in the mining business. And uh, after two, three days, they came back with a report telling, hey, we made a study. We're showing what you have today. We show you together with our expertise what you can get tomorrow. And I mean, it, it, it was amazing. And uh, then uh, our colleagues at the mining business say, let's run a proof of concept with us guys. They did it together with the Boolean and mining giant and one of our customers, together with ABB and together with universes. And it, it ran out in an excellent result, excellent result. And then we run to a next step, which is a productization. So, so uh, I'm excited, as you can see, maybe. <laughs> I love that point. And I love that excitement uh, and the energy. Yeah. And uh, I know that uh, you have it too, Jonathan. So can I have your view? Was this a, like the perfect match? Or did you have to do a lot of work to see how you can fit in with this project? Yeah, I mean, it was a fair amount of work, actually, I must say. It was actually a completely new departure for universes, which was what was so exciting about us. Our, our heritage is... Uh, very much from autonomous vehicles, more uh, out in normal uh, locations like the street or a factory or indeed a hospital, as Martin said. So the mine was a new a new domain for us. But uh, once we had spoke to the people at ABB, we'd understood the, the nature of the problem that they were trying to solve. We'd understood a bit more about the environment, um, about the sensing we could use. We were able to wrestle with the problem, uh, consider the different options going forward, and then propose an interesting solution that uh, we thought was going to solve their problem. And based off that proposal, we then started to work together. Uh, as Martin said, we did an early proof of concept um, to prove that what we were saying we could do was possible. Uh, and once we'd proven that, and people within ABB had seen the evidence of that, uh, there was a strong willingness to move forward to the next stage. Uh, and as I said in the video, the really exciting thing is that now we are getting forward to the stage where we're beginning to turn it into a, a prototype, uh, deploy that prototype in location uh, on a mine uh, to actually carry out some useful work uh, yeah. and, then, uh, and, and then iterate uh, towards uh, and, and scale. Uh, and one of the things we hear um, through our contacts at ABB is actually this project is getting a lot of, uh, a lot of attention, um, um, both from the mining industry more widely, but also other industries as well who see what's happening in the mining domain and think actually that's kind of transferable to another domain as well. We have robots and systems that need to be automated and made more autonomous. We could use this type of technology to do that. Uh, and I think it's really exciting to see that trend happening that um, advanced sensor processing and computer vision and AI is typically applied to uh, autonomous cars, to uh, more the gaming industry perhaps, but now we're seeing it transfer into these more industrialized uh, applications as well. And, and, and I can see the excitement uh, in your face, Martin, uh, but what about your colleagues and Boliden? Has they have the same energy, the driving force to, to make this happen? Sorry, once again, please. Uh, what about the, the passion and the excitement or maybe the culture at uh, ABB? Did you have to work to get this project going on or how is the innovation uh, culture? Uh, I would say that the, the ignition and the, 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 the energy from the startups together with our, our long experience and traditional big, large corporations and our network is a very good match. There are sometimes there are sometimes like, hey, we don't really understand each other, but we learn from each other. And, and uh, as universes and a team, and we have many examples of that, they are very, um, how, what can I say, pain in the ass. They are eager to make things happen. They are pushing us forward. And I love that. We kind of be a little bit, uh, hey, what's happening? But after, after them providing us with solution ideas and use cases that, that then the, the things happen. There are several cases and Jonathan the order they have four projects with us. You have several leads. These guys are telling us what we can do, how we can implement that technology. We know the technology, but we don't really know how to adapt it in our products. They're telling us 
And it might be that they are not 100% correct all the time, of course. The use cases is hard, and we have a look in the business case, but when they ignite these ideas all the time, it reads down to, to the business case in other areas. So I'm, I'm really excited, really. And, and to be that uh, pain in the ass, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, how, tell me more about your startup. How many people are you? Uh, do you have the capability of coping with all these new leads that I guessing, I'm guessing that this actually are, uh, yeah. are happening for you? I mean, at first, I just wanted to say how proud and honored I am to be called a pain in the ass. Truly <laughs> <laughs> really tremendous of that. But uh, we're about 35 people now. Um, in, we're based in the center of Stockholm, um, all experts in computer vision, um, and we're working in different industries. And it's, it's, as I say, it's really exciting times for us now, because actually, there are, there are many different domains that are interested in understanding what computer vision, what advanced sensor processing, processing can do for them. Uh, general perception as well. Uh, and, and to sort of give an example of what Martin was talking about, actually, he, we've been talking with some, with some people in the ABB uh, uh, smart cities domain now as well. So just to give you an, an indication of the diversity of where uh, the different applications of this kind of technology could be applied to. Um, so it, we, we've gone from autonomous cars to mines to smart cities and, and who knows where next. Uh, it's a really exciting time. And uh, I always uh, give you that opportunity, call to action for you as a startup, uh, Jonathan. Is it anything you want to address in the chat or any connections you need uh, for the future? Please share. Uh, that I need for yes. the future? Oh, okay. Um, well, look, I mean, I, it's uh, one of the, the big pushes that the company is trying at the moment. We're experts in perception, but as I said, we've been working now with smart cities. So if you are a city or a municipality um, uh, that is in need of, of data, um, we are uh, now taking our perception technologies, uh, our computer vision, and we are squeezing them down to run on a smartphone. Uh, and what that means is you can take that smartphone and put it in the dash of a, a taxi or a bus or even your own vehicle. And that means you can gather data about the city about the environment uh, and to help manage the environment in a better way. So it's a new initiative that we're, we're doing and we're, we're hoping to work with ABB in that space too. So it's, uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, I'd love to hear from people who, are, who work for cities and municipalities and uh, these types of organizations. Perfect. I will have Linus to, to uh, address that as well in the chat so we can have that question going on. Uh, so uh, let's move back to you, Martin. Uh, pain in the ass. Uh, you love those startups. So can mm -hmm. you tell me more about uh, A ABB and Cineleap? How many projects or how many uh, startups have you collaborated with so far? We have, um, we have 91 startups as members. We have created 120 collaborations so far, and the collaboration is always a paid collaboration, otherwise we don't count it. So it's 120 in together in the, all four business areas. I mean, there are still a lot, lot more to go, a lot more to do. <laughs> that's amazing. And that was my, my next question. Are you looking for startups in an, any specific area? Because that could be a call to action for you as well. Of course, and we will be part of the matchmaking tomorrow, but for sure we're looking for startups in, in the many areas and uh, artificial intelligence is one of these key areas for sure. And I mean, you, had, you have met so many startups uh, during the years, uh, I imagine, and you told me about being that pain in the ass. We have that as a, yes. <laughs> a quote right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Any more tips for the startups before they are meeting a corporate? Can you share yes. some? Yes, please. Uh, invest that single one hour to read about us carefully to see which products, which customer do we have, which domains are we working in. So you go on the first meeting, meeting me or my colleagues and you tell, hey, I know that you have that project or you have that customer or you have that technology or even have uh, that robot and try to apply your solution. And that is when, when we really say, hey, there's something, but then we have something to discuss around and, and do that from the beginning. And Give us a use case. It could be a stupid use case. There are no stupid use, but it could be a whatever. I mean, we have seen the startups that do that being the pain in the ass, calling us, showing on, on cases all the time, 
And I heard so many times afterwards people say, hey, I was a little bit shocked in the beginning, but I'm so glad that they continue calling me, they continue to show me the use cases and the business cases. And now we have two or three projects running. So really. It's, that's it's also, it, Martin. I think that's a really good point because that's, that's, yeah. that, that create gets your mind thinking in different ways, actually. Yes. And actually, it, it's the combination of the two. Because as a startup, the other thing problem we have is, is we don't know whose door to knock on. And we don't know the problem space. We know the technology, but we don't know how to apply it and where the problem space is. So that's what's so fantastic about talking to you at Cineleaf and you guiding us in that way. Exactly. We can talk to you about the tech, but we need an application to apply it to. Uh, and as you say, even if we're wrong first time, at least it provokes the thinking. And at least it makes people actually consider um, the, 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 it, it illustrates the, the art of the possible with the technology so that then they can think about their problem space and think how it might be applied to. So was it? And as a yep. last thing for me here, or one thing more. As universes, they really understand us. They know that we are different, and we have different time cycles. We are different, and we are big, and we are global. And but they don't change. They continue being as they was from the beginning. They don't tune in to being slower or less enthusiastic. Or they continue, and we need that. Don't change. Understand us, but don't change. Continue being a startup with the passion, emotion, and curiosity. Yeah, and the, the, I, I know that uh, a lot of star, uh, corporates are into that, uh, f that quick uh, changing uh, or uh, lean startup way of working. Uh, can Good you job. share some uh, from that, uh, Jonathan? Because it's all about uh, you have your technology, but I guess you have pivoted uh, some uh, times uh, during. Can oh, you share absolutely. us? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the world of a startup is, is quite dynamic, shall yeah. we say. You, you start off with some hypotheses about what the market will want to do with your technology. Uh, you go and talk to people in the market and try and understand if you're right. Um, and often you're wrong, frankly. Uh, and the, the point is that you try and then adapt and, and update and change and respond. Universes, when they first started out about five years ago, were focused on computer games, headset tracking for AR and VR headsets. Um, uh, and when Apple and Google and Facebook got involved in that space, we decided that it was something we'd, we'd probably move to a different industry. Uh, and it turns out that the technology to track a headset is very similar to the technology to track uh, an autonomous car uh, driving down the road. So we had a very, um, uh, we could uh, tr um, change the technology's application space to focus on different areas. And it's the same thing when we spoke to Martin as well. We spoke to him about what we were doing and he looked at me quizzically and said, what are you talking about? what we actually should do is focus here. But it was because we spoke and we gave him the, the, the thought of the use case that he said, actually, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but the technology could be applied here in this space. Uh, and that was the um, that allowed us to start this collaboration, which has been very fruitful. You might be wondering what this, 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 uh, this, is, this is our contract with ABB. It's the, the biggest contract you've ever seen. <laughs> really, really uh, truly wonderful stuff. And it's, um, it was something we were awarded last year uh, as, as one of the, the, the beacons of collaboration between a startup and uh, a large corporate. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for that story. From, from gaming to uh, totally out of field. And we have some questions in uh, the chat for uh, you. Martin, uh, is there some area department in ABB through coordinate the collaboration with startup? Uh, because it looks like there is an innovative culture in the corporate. Can you share yes. some comments? And I know Sunilip, so tell me a little bit more how it works. Sunilip is actually an accelerator for Sunilip. You apply on Sinelib.com webpage. Uh, we have a review board where we look into your technology, if it fits into ABB or if it's into our customers, or even, even if it doesn't fit into our needs, we also look if you will be boosted by being a member of Sinelib. So we always look at both angles. And uh, then uh, if, you're up, if you're applying for Sinelib membership and you get on board, then we help you with uh, business development. We help you with matchmaking with an ABB. We help you with matchmaking with our industry partners. If you have a collaboration with ABB, we make sure that all the decision makers and all ABB get to know about this collaboration, etc. So we are, we are supporting you on the way to make business with ABB, industrial partners or customers. Yes, Synergy.com. 
Sure, a good pitch there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I just want to address that uh, because I'm always curious about the time frame here because I know that you at Synerlip try to do everything to speed it up, uh, the collaborations. Uh, so from your first meeting, how long time did it take uh, for you to get the first collaboration in place? Is that to Jonathan or to me? To both of you. We can see if you, you have the same picture, because we see that the culture and the, that could be yeah. a different thing. In, in the beginning, we had uh, one collaboration every third month. Today, we have one collaboration starting every week. Each one of the collaboration has increased with almost a factor 10 of investment. I mean, if you if you spent, uh, you're spending seven or 10 times more on each one of the collaboration. It means that purchase order going out from ABB. So everything is increasing, mm. but also the quality and the number of startups as well, so sure. And we have improved all the, the legal documents, the process, et cetera, to make sure that when you get on board, you get a global NDA, you don't have to sign an NDA with 100,000 people. You sign it with once and it's for all. And then you have a frame agreement. That means that you're a proud partner of ABB. If you want to make business with ABB, it's allowed, et cetera, et cetera. And it's still a membership. Yeah. If you want to go to one of uh, our competitors or somebody else, of course, you can make business with them. You don't, if you want to leave us after three months, but like I can say we have 91 members and uh, we haven't had no whatsoever that nobody uh, wants to do business with somebody else. But okay, that could happen. Yeah. And I, we want universes to succeed. If they do business with, with uh, our friends in the ecosystem, we are very, very happy of that. Sure. And that's about the sharing, I, I believe, that mentality. Yes. Uh, Jonathan, uh, from your first meeting, uh, I mean, it, it has to be a change also for you to go from that gaming to, to change or pivot to another area. How long time did it take for you? So I, I think it was about, it was a few months from the first meeting of, of Martin to actually get, getting the, the, the project kicked off. Um, the, the process of the transition from the gaming had, had been been going for a, for a while now, but I actually, I mean, I, I found that that to be fairly standard. I'm, I'm, I thought, um, uh, you know, it, it, it takes time to, to to build a relationship, um, to 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 get the trust and the the the, um, the people in place and the sign off in place, so that actually you can start to work together. Uh, and I think that was what Martin alluded to. Actually, is that we did a lot of things up front. Uh, to try and build that trust and to try and put the, the, the foundation in place in a solid way. Uh, and that meant that actually when, as, as the process sort of moved through the, through the, the stages within ABB, actually it, it was facilitated and allowed to move more simply because that trust had been built up. Uh, and that meant we could move forward faster. And, and of course, as, as uh, at, at each next subsequent stage, as Martin said, it gets longer and a larger size of PO, but it's also easier to make that transition in some way because you've built up that track record. You now have that reputation as someone who is capable, who can deliver, who is ex has expertise in the technology that can really add some value. Uh, and that means that we can leverage that reputation to, to, to go both uh, deeper into a particular project, but also go into other projects as well. Thank you. So building trust, starting small, and uh, also to be a pain in the ass is lesson learned from this one. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your inspirational story. I'm looking forward to hear more uh, from you. And good luck tomorrow with your meetings at the matchmaking. Thank you so much again uh, and hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. So we are about to dive deeper again, and this time from innovation to implementation and commercialization, a deep talk. Here we go. So we are about to finalize this conference with our last discussion, or actually a deep talk about innovation. But if we look back, we had some really interesting discussions, case studies in different fields. We have been touching the transformation of democracy, energy, industry and safety.
So let's dive deeper now and have a really interesting discussion between two people that you don't want to miss. Uh, let's first introduce Daria Isaksson. She is the Director General at Vinova, Sweden's innovation agency, and Robert Andrén, Director General, Swedish Energy Agency. So let's welcome them uh, with a warm hand to this discussion. And Daria, you are welcome to start. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here and it's been a fantastic day. Um, now, if we learn anything from the COVID pandemic that we're currently living through, it's that the challenges of our time are global, complex and deeply systemic in nature. We need to acknowledge that we're all part of a system that's perfectly designed to deliver the outcomes that we're currently getting. And the pandemic shows that we have serious vulnerabilities in anything from how we set up our global value chains to how we manage resources, not least planetary resources related to food and biodiversity. Also, even a lockdown of big parts of society has resulted in a mere blip in the global carbon dioxide emissions. Science is really clear. The next nine years is the decisive decade, the make it or break it decade, not for this century, not for this millennia, but for the future of a human society. And this is not about saving the planet. It will be fine without us. We have a really harsh and real deadline. If we succeed, to adhere to scientific-based targets of cutting emissions in half every decade using technologies, knowledge, and innovation opportunities available to us today, then we will effectively have set society on a path towards a future where our chi children already in school will live and prosper in a society that's better than the one we have right now. However, if we fail, the consequences are abysmal. So the bad news is this. We're in the middle of an existential crisis for humanity. We've already run out of time and we are not on track. We can no longer afford the wasteful business models outside of planetary boundaries. And right now, research and innovation is not yet solving societal problems quickly enough. <laughs> the good news though. So the good news is we have most of the knowledge and technology we need to make this transformation real in the next decade. AI is one of the most important exponential technologies at our disposal. It's important to help us leverage how to more quickly find new solutions, design new solutions, optimize systems, enable circularity and optimize use. And that's true regardless of where we look into batteries, the energy grids, mobility systems, food systems and more. So, Industrial transformation has always happened exponentially, also in previous times, and we must make sure that that's what we do again. Therefore, we're also in the middle of the biggest opportunity for value creation since the first industrial revolution reshaped the entire society in the 18th and 19th century. So therefore, increasing our ability to apply knowledge into new innovations, new products, new business models, and in innovations that impact our behavior all at scale is the most important ability in our society today. I'm really, really happy therefore that to be part of this day, the Sweden Innovation Day, that shows that we have many leaders in innovation within industry, academia and startups working together to make this transformation real. And I really look forward to this discussion on how we can improve our ability of making the innovations scale and have even larger impact. Because at this point in time, innovation is existential. Thank you so much, Daria. Over to you, Robert. Okay, thank you so much and thank you for having me here participating at this very important meeting. Um, as Daria said, we're in the currently in the midst of a troublesome pandemic and all societies around the world is actually under a lot of stress. Uh, however, difficult times we are experiencing, uh, where face-to-face -face interactions are at a minimum. We still have digital innovations to thank that we can have this meeting, have this possibility to still continue to have a discussion and a dialogue, to still keep moving on uh, and meet our challenges. I think that's fascinating and it actually puts the finger on the importance of innovations. Uh, 
However serious the situation is, and we should not underestimate it, of course, uh, it's our obligation, I believe, that we need to see and seize the opportunities that lies within this pandemic crisis that we are experiencing. We need to deal with this problem, this crisis, without counteracting the work we are doing to face another, even more massive crisis, the climate change. Because that will affect our societies in a truly massive way. Uh, and I think that the economic uh, effects we see today from the corona pandemic is but a glimpse of what we will experience and that will follow the climate change. So the true challenge uh, we have is to f uh, get more green innovations out to the market uh, that actually can help us fight both the pandemic and, at the same time, the climate change. I think that what many people are saying today is that we need to restart. And when it comes to the energy sector, I say it's not a question of restarting. It's a question of nudging and pushing forward the already set agenda, because what we saw before the pandemic was a green transition taking place. A green transition where huge actors, industries, are moving towards fossil-free uh, production and systems and a way of going about the business. So I, th I say that it's quite important that we keep on track so that we don't fall back to the old ways of doing things just to get our economies going again when we're uh, kind of moving out slowly from the pandemic. Uh, we're in a, common, uh, in a more and more increasingly complex society where various sectors are, are interconnected in a way that we've never seen before, where the energy sector is more digitalized and automized than ever before, where we see that the smart grids are doing a lot of things, but not only kind of pushing ele ele electrons back and forth to various places, but it actually th starts to help us using the electricity and the energy in a much, much more efficient way. So I think that we are actually uh, uh, on a very good spot to take a, a real leapfrogging when it comes to transforming society into sustainability. And we have at the Swedish Energy Agency uh, also pointed at the importance of, in the future, not only looking at the economic return when you do investments, you also need to look at the climate and environmental and societal uh, profile and values of new innovations. So we've gathered a number, 200 or so Swedish in innovation companies, and we can say that if they are put on the market, getting to the market, scaled up, we have a reduction of carbon dioxide emissions that is 20 times what we are uh, uh, sending out today from Sweden in total. I think that's very, very fascinating and very, very uh, important to realize. So actually, we have a possibility, but there are no silver bullets. We need to work, we need to work together, and we need to gather the actors and, and do this uh, hand in hand, so to say. So this day is one of those uh, days where you, we, we actually can move things together forward. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, so what about not going back to normal? What can we make differently in the future? Uh, if we look back at the case studies that we had during uh, today, uh, we had some different fields. And I know that your agency plays a crucial, very important role here. Uh, but what can we do more? What do you see that corporate and public sector and decision makers can do more about it. Maybe you want to specify in different two fields. We had the democracy, energy, industry and safety. Please give me your thoughts about that. Do you want to start, Daria? One of the things that we need to be honest about is that we see, not least in the efforts to uh, invest uh, countries' way out of the pandemic or as a result of the pandemic, we see increased investments into research and innovation as part of the strategy of how to uh, restart economies everywhere. So I think that's important to acknowledge and also important for Sweden. And then the matter is about uh, making those investments uh, be impactful uh, towards the new normal that we all need. Um, for that to happen, 
I think that for one thing that we can improve, and we've seen some good examples, is how we address, for instance, the ethical aspects immediately, already building on in our research, but also at the first apply, uh, applications and the experiments that we're conducting, so that's important. But also increasing our ability to uh, include citizens and widen the participation in the innovation ecosystem. So we've seen some examples of how to do that through public dialogue, which is important, to raise awareness, to, to create engagement in priorities that are necessary. But it's also important to create real participation because at a wider scale, the ability for citizens to partake is also important for the um, implementation, for instance, in the healthcare sector. So this is why uh, addressing lifelong learning, both in making you know, important educational resources available, creating incentives for it, doing it in a way so that people can actually learn continuously while they have jobs. All of these are really important and they require, as we know, both reforms, increased actions, not least from universities and educational resources, but actually also prioritization in every organization out there that actually has employees. So um, I'd like to note that, for instance, applied machine learning, the barriers to that are now so low <laughs> that it's quite possible to make it part of any college curriculum. And I think that type of understanding matters uh, uh, for us as a society. And then another thing that we need to improve is our ability to address societal challenges from a systems perspective, meaning that we have a long tradition and we're quite good actually at addressing innovation from a supply perspective, improving technology, addressing it together between academia, industry and small actors, etc. But these innovations quite commonly uh, require infrastructure in terms of energy supply, in terms of digital infrastructure. They push and demand um, policy changes to be made. Um, and they also, in order for them to be implemented in an ethical way, require to be addressed in a more multidisciplinary fashion. All of this requires all of us as actors in the innovation system uh, to increase the ability of, of working in a system uh, with a systems perspective uh, and addressing these different things together. So both innovation supply and demand at the same time. Because to be honest, innovations through technology, solving problems is very important. We still have important tech gaps to address. We still have funding gaps for those solutions to scale. But we also need to address the policies, incentives, and the innovations that uh, change our behavior and impact our uh, demand for these solutions. So working on those issues together is quite important as well. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, Robert, do you want to address that question in some way? Or no, I do agree a lot with what Daria said, because I think dialogue is, is key here. Mm. Uh, among uh, all stakeholders, uh, but also uh, the civil society. Uh, and I think that the, 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 what we see today within the energy sector is that people are more and more trying to find ways to, to, to do their own bits when it comes to climate and energy, for, for it to be sustainable, to renewable. And what we see when wind power is increasing, when we see solar panels are coming, it also changes the, 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 the gender <laughs> aspect of energy sector, moving more towards uh, a more uh, equal way of thinking, because you have an, a different dimensions, different way of seeing things as well in society. And I think that what we need to do is to, to listen to that, and that, that, that's why we have to broaden the dialogue. Another thing that I think is very important is actually to start discussing the risk sharing between the public and the private sector. Mm. We have a way of doing it in, in, in Sweden, in Europe, where we are putting a lot of, of, of should we say, public money into good ideas, innovations, up to a certain limit. And then we're just saying, OK, you're on your own now. Mm. Uh, you have to find your, your new, new uh, companions when it comes to financing. And I think we have to realize that I think the public sector needs to do more to get things starting uh, for real, scale up, commercialize innovations that are sustainable, because it's a question of the whole society's future. Mm. So that is one thing I really uh, believe is important, uh, aside of, of getting more actors involved and actually uh, listen to each other much more than we do today. I see that you want to address that, Daria. <laughs>
But uh, if we see that uh, we are talking about the ecosystem uh, and we have all the different players in the ecosystem uh, and we see that Ignite has been one of the so to call interactive spaces where we can meet. Is it anything more we can do now when we go global as we do with this event, trying to really show the case studies? Uh, what do you see that we can do more uh, in the ecosystem? Different players can do more, maybe the incubators, the investors, the corporates. Uh, what do you, do you seek to have that sweet spot of really making them work together to collaborate? Robert, you can start. Y yes, I can start. Uh, what, I, what I see is a positive movement among uh, big companies like uh, BlackRock, for instance, and you also hear it from the, the, the huge uh, pension funds and stuff, that they are moving slowly towards sustainability thinking. Uh, and I think that what we need is that there are more demands put within the private sector from actors. Mm -hmm. And we have one example that I think is very fascinating now where, where Gothenburg Harbor is, is saying that we will be fossil free by 2025 or, or 30. Uh, so they're putting a, a pressure on, on the other actors, private actors, and saying that you want to join in in this trip towards uh, sustainability, you need to get your act together. Yeah. And what we see is that there is an interest. So I think courage in the private sector and in the investment sector is quite important. And courage comes from uh, valuing other things than the economic return uh, in two or three or five years. Yeah. We need another way of looking at that. And that's, that's an attitude issue. Mm. And, it, and I think uh, that also that's also speaking to ourselves as government agencies, because in order to actually make that type of innovation happen, be it the truly automated and sustainable harbor or you know part of the city, um, it's really going to require public sector engagement as well in terms of how procurement is being made, in terms of uh, adequately and with speed addressing the regulatory issues that will you know. Uh, surface in that type of innovation project. So I'm really happy to see that we're more and more within the government agencies that understand the importance of also us being engaged in the innovation practices. Um, you know, before my time at Vinova, when I was speaking to boards about the necessity about having innovation and digital transformation as key issues on the strategic agenda, making real prioritizations, you know, giving mandate, putting uh, money where your mouth is, etc. That's still true, uh, but it's far more mainstream today. And so today, I guess that what we're saying is that for both uh, public sector and, and business to actually harness the opportunities for real value creation that are here and also so urgent, uh, what we need is to um, start having strategies that build on being the driver of this transformation, using planetary boundaries as actually um, boundary requirements for our strategy, but really being the drivers of the transformation, and then also including partners for societal impact and for addressing you know, inclusion and, and social sustainability. Um, and I think that what's so encouraging is that today we see that we have leaders, innovation leaders within both uh, industrial leaders, startups, and others that are doing just that. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I think that's, that's what makes me optimistic about the future as well as for the competitiveness of Sweden, because that's exactly what we need to do. I just think that we can get even better at that. Thank you so much. I, I think that's a great final word from you. Do you have anything to address, uh, Robert, as your final words? Well, I, I want to just underline what Daria said. I think I'm also very optimistic. And as I said in the beginning, what we see now is that there is a continuation of what started before the pandemic. It, it continues and it actually even increases in some aspects. We see huge actors out there, private ones, that, that needs to be in the forefront of changing, uh, that are saying that, you know, fossil systems are the history, tomorrow's systems are fossil free digital, smart in any way. And, and I think Sweden has a huge possibility of being a leader in this transition and transformation because we have already kind of experienced and have good examples to lean on uh, that we can export to others because the climate change is, is a global uh, challenge. 
uh, but we can also do positive business within that work. And so, uh, and, and I see an, an increased interest and in dialogue between public, private, uh, among private, among the public sector, but also at various levels, because we cannot forget that we need to have the local communities also on board, uh, because that's actually where the change of lives needs to be done and occur with the new innovations. But, but I'm, I'm also purely optimistic, and I think that this event is so important. So good work, everyone out there. And thank you, Ignite. Yeah, thank you so much, Ignite. And thank you for uh, this uh, discussion. And I think it's really interesting to hear that we have the technology, we have different collaboration going on, and it's all about daring to take risk and having the right mindset. Thank you so much. And we are about to go to our final parts of the conference. And we have been talking about mindset a lot. Uh, and uh, now I would like to hear a little bit more really soon about the mindset that has been going on in the chat. But before that, you actually have one more minute, 60 seconds to vote on our startups. Remember, a really quick run through, uh, nine different startups, Spark Beyond from Israel, Detonic, South Korea, Blinking Germany, Greater Dan, Sweden, Rax, Brazil, Artelius, India, Quam from France, Sainal from US, Cold Start from Canada. 60 more seconds, rush into the poll and uh, press the button so you are with us and voting on this AI startup company. But let's move on to my colleague up from Umeå, Linus. You have been hosting our chat room during the event. Uh, can you please share us uh, some of your key takeaways from the chat? Absolutely. I mean, there have been a lot of people uh, in the conversations. There are hundreds of chat messages, a lot of hoorays for the speakers and the startups and all the collaborations. And I also see that people have been, uh, I mean, getting in contact with each other, uh, helping out in all sorts of ways. But my key takeaway, I, I think it is the fact that when we were talking about it earlier, this, uh, it's more about the people than the tech. And I mean, tomorrow we have all these match making meetings from startups all over the world and corporations from all over the world. And hopefully there will be a match there. But I think that if we all think about all these challenges that will come up along the way, I mean, we are from different cultures and different languages and all those things that could be a problem. If we know about them beforehand, then maybe it will be easier to find a good collaboration. That's a key takeaway for me. and many in the chat as well, I would say. And, and we actually have about 20 minutes to go in the chat room. So uh, be, be with us until the very last end. And Linus will be there to take care of you. So, so feel free to ask any last questions to us or uh, ask for connections uh, for anything that would create value. Thank you so much, Linus, for hosting the chat. And you will be with us for a while more. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. And uh, moving on to a really interesting panel discussion. And uh, I've heard uh, some of the speakers that are going to join us. Uh, we have a best practice on startup collaboration, a corporate perspective. So from the corporate point of view, uh, what are really important and what values are creating from a startup collaboration. And with me, uh, we have Anna Karin from Husqvarna, Frederick from Michelin, Per from IKEA and Vanessa from Almenyttan Public Housing Going Digital Project. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hi and welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And uh, the four of you, I know uh, that you have a lot of uh, excellent stories to share, but I'm always curious what are the things that makes us get out of bed in the morning? The passion, the why, why we are going to work. So the question goes to you. Why are your corporate, uh, your organization work with startup? Can you have one single thing that is most important? And I would like to start with you, Per. 
Thank you for that. And uh, the one thing that makes IKEA once work with startup is that we are a value and vision driven company. We're here to create a better everyday life for the many people. Our direction talks about doing this by becoming much more accessible to people, by having a much much more affordable and have a positive impact on the people, planet, and society. And these are big things. There are no silver bullets. We need to do hundreds of things. And even if we in IKEA have more than 200,000 passionate and competent co-workers, we need to work together with all the smart brains out in the world, the entrepreneurs, the universities, the innovators. So this is for us both a wish and a need to be able to fulfill our vision. And uh, could you just give me one example that you have been part of that created real value for you at I IKEA, collaborating with a startup? Absolutely. But first I would like to say, we don't look for something that creates big value for us in IKEA. When I work with startups, we always want to find the free winners. What is good for the customer? What is good for the partner? And what is good for IKEA? So always, we always work with these free winners. And we have a couple of collaborations with startups. Unfortunately, most of that is not really launched yet, so we can't really talk about it. But we recently talked about a collaboration with the Danish startup called Flowloop, where they have a really revolutionary new way of doing water recycling in a shower. And as we all know, we have too little fresh water on the earth and the majority of the fresh water we use in the wrong way. 10% of the fresh water in the world is used in the households. And all of you with teenagers at home, you know how much of that is spent in the shower. So if we can recycle that shower, shower water, we will really reduce the water. So working with Flowloop, they have a great innovation on how to recycle the water. Then we add IKEA's solid knowledge in technology, materials, in production orientation. And then we can get the innovation from Flow Loop, add it up with all the knowledge in IKEA, and then we can bring in great products at a much lower price to the customers. So that is a recent example. Thank you so much, Per. And uh, the same question goes to you, Anna Karin. What do you say uh, at Husqvarna? If you could single out one thing. Yeah, I mean, it's really difficult to choose only one thing. I mean, there are so many benefits of uh, working with uh, uh, different partners, and I would say in particular innovative startups. But uh, I think Per was touching upon it. If I, the, the one I would choose is really like the enhanced customer value that I believe this uh, this collaboration these collaborations bring. It gives us really this edge to stay relevant and also explore new areas uh, that would bring value to our customers. Uh, and then uh, I think your example there with the uh, pair with with this dish startup and also driving sustainability and circularity is something that we've been focusing a lot on uh, during the past months and. Uh, uh, digitalization, uh, AI, uh, data-driven services, all of those are enablers for the circular economy. So I think there is a great fit there for bringing that customer value to the market together with startups in these areas. Thank you, Ankatin. So uh, customer value. Uh, and uh, going on to Frederick from Michelin, uh, if you could address that question, one single thing, is that possible for you? No, oh, yeah, that's possible. Uh, if I have to pick up one, will, that will be definitely the fast testing solution. Actually, for an industrial group like us, we are very adverse to risk, okay? And that makes a lot of sense to outsource this risk party. So testing solutions with startups means removing the risk out of an innovation or a service very quickly and in a very cost-effective way. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, the same question to Vanessa. Can you single out one thing for you? Well, I would say, uh, so I don't work with one company. I work with a hundred of the Swedish public housing companies, the municipality owned 
housing companies. And, um, you know, every seventh Swede lives in one of our apartments or dwellings. So that's 800,000 apartments all in all. And it's really, really important for our companies to be in touch with the startup scene and find collaborations because the startups bring today and will even more so, I'm sure, bring the relevant services that the, the, uh, our tenants, our customers are looking for. And of course, uh, also like, oops, I was going to say a second thing. I'm going to stick to my first thing. <laughs> Thank you. And I know it's difficult because there is a lot of values going on here. And uh, we heard the win, 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 I usually say. There are a lot of wins going on here. Uh, but... Uh, I mean, we have a lot of value creation going on here, but if you could, do you seek any specific field pair that you are missing, addressing the question to you first? Any more you wish to see startups uh, applying to you with the new solution, new fields areas? Or what are you looking into right now? Uh, it's a very big question, mm -hmm. this, what we are looking at. Since we are into this with affordability, accessibility and sustainability, that covers so many areas. So we are looking from every, into all of these aspects. We do development of new materials. We do uh, order orchestration development for lost my deliveries. We do new product types. We do new digital solutions to make it easier for customers to get in contact with IKEA and to understand what they will buy and how it will look in their homes. So I think it's a it's a mix of all these. And also the way of working is a lot connected to what Frederick say about how can you do it fast? How can you do it in a risk avert way? So I think it's a, we are looking very broad in IKEA but it needs to tick these boxes. It needs to be affordable. And this is the challenge because we want to really reach the many people. And to do that, all of you startups out there, when you think about that you have a product that is low price, we need to cut another 90%, then we're home. <laughs> yeah. It's and sustainability ambition. And we don't talk about decreasing our carbon footprint. We talk about we want to have a positive impact on people, planet and sea. And that means that we are having really high, high bar for this one. And we would love to have startups all over the world support us on this. Oh, that's a really good shout out and uh, kind of a reversed pitch for the startups. I hope that all of you that are listening right now did get that uh, from Per and uh, might be reaching out in the chat or maybe on LinkedIn. Maybe you will have uh, many new uh, people uh, want to join you on LinkedIn, Per. Uh, what about you, Anna? I really hope so. <laughs> that's good. If you could pitch uh, Anna Karin uh, Huskvana, what are you looking for right now? Is it any specific field or what are your barriers to, to get in touch with a startup? So I would say like the, the most important thing is for us to uh, connect it to our strategy and our vision and where we are going and uh, then find the gaps. Uh, where do we need help? Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's in these areas where we will see most benefit. Sometimes it is like in areas we, where we are also doing a lot of things ourselves. Uh, but sometimes it could be areas where, where we like, this is something that, that we are not going to do ourselves. Um, so uh, uh, it might not be that we know that we're looking for an, a specific technology for a specific problem. Uh, but uh, for example, we know that we are going to launch at least 50 the new circular innovations before 2025 and we know how to measure them so then we talk to startups and invite them to come and help us so that's that's one area uh, but the part of our, of our strategy is to uh, move more towards solutions and servitization uh, so we, we look a lot in that and with that comes also uh, the data-driven services uh, AI machine learning knowing more about where our products are, how they are doing. Um, so those are key areas for us, where we are already working with a lot of startups, but uh, constantly looking for more. 
Thank you, Anna Karen. And moving on to you, Frederick, uh, what about Michelin? What kind of new directions are you looking into? Many, many, many. Uh, many. many um, yeah, actually, the, the, the point will be uh, <clears throat> more for the startups to come at the right point. You know, I think we, well, everybody knows that Michelin is deeply involved in mobility, uh, in new materials, and, and a lot of different other things. But come to us at the very um, right level of maturity, and that will raise the level of being, um, you know, listening uh, to. The, the issue we, we have with the startup at the moment is that um, they, have, they don't have the product or the product is just an oily. Uh, the product has no maturity in the market and therefore that makes the whole thing very, very difficult. Bear in mind that large groups have different processes than, than startups. Different mind thinking, um, different way of processing things. So we have to bridge this gap uh, all the time. Mm. And uh, we actually discussed that in the last track as well, to, to have startup being a bit of pain in the ass and really come with new solutions, open-minded, uh, and maybe they need to be a bit mature to have done some pox before, before they meet you for that. Uh, moving on to, to last, uh, Vanessa, uh, what do you say about which field are you looking into? Or what do you need to be in place when you meet a startup? Well, the, the um, Swedish public housing sector, we're, we're just in the start of creating this kind of innovation program where we can collaborate and find synergies, both looking into what each and every company's different needs, but also what can we do together on, on scale. Uh, so the, the areas that we work it within at the moment is data-driven services that could be connected to the smart house but also very much in focus, the, the, uh, our customers, the people who, who are living in our houses. Uh, and I would actually like to catch, catch on uh, to Frederick's comments there about timing. So, so um, we had some really mature companies to work with, but we also have companies that are, are growing and learning to work in, in an agile way and with startups. So it's so much about finding, doing the matching work that Ignite is helping us with so uh, in such a great fashion to, to find that the right startup, often it's, um, uh, we found in this first process that we need quite a clear offer for the pilot and the collaboration to take off. But hopefully within 12 or 18 months, uh, we can take the next step there. Mm. Thank you so much, Vanessa, and thank to, thanks to all of you. And I mean, I see this as a bit of a reversed pitch where you actually told all the startups out there what you are looking for and what uh, stage they be, need to be in to uh, connect with you. And hopefully you will get a lot of new connections on LinkedIn uh, in uh, the following days. Uh, and. Uh, I would just say good luck for you that has meetings tomorrow. And uh, thank you so much for being a part of this last uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for inviting us. Thanks for a great day. And uh, uh, yeah, we have heard that uh, before, the timing and the mindset and how difficult it is to find the right person at the right time at the right uh, company, the right position. And uh, we will discuss that r shortly, but first, we like to celebrate. And usually when we have the Ignite conference, we do a lot of celebration, right, Stina? Are you ready for celebration? <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, actually coming in with something huge in my hand. Yeah, yeah, we have the Global AI Startup Pitch Contest yes. that are uh, finalized. Yes. I'm curious, hopefully all, all the startups are with us uh, right now and are really curious. Are we ready for the result? Are we ready for the result? Should we do uh, like this drum roll. drum roll or really taking it slow and asking a lot of questions in between? I think we're going to ask a lot of questions in between. Yeah. yeah. How's the weather in Stockholm today? 
It was, it, it's nice actually, it's kind of, uh, it wasn't raining, but I had been here inside the studio all day, so. I would say it's like 11 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Is that kind of, no. Now let's move <laughs> let's into move it. On. Let's go. Okay, let's so go. So the winner is, drum roll. <laughs> Blinkin <laughs> from um, Germany. A big congrats to Blinking. Do we have Blinking with us? Yeah, hello. Thanks a lot, right? <laughs> At least one member of Blinkin is this you. Thanks a lot for the honor and for yeah, the prize. No idea what we actually won, but looking forward to hear it from you right now. Right. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, actually, what you have actually won is that uh, when Corona allows, uh, we will invite you to Sweden and uh, Ignite, uh, together with AI Sweden, together with all our incubators, will set up a fantastic program for you. So we can kind of assure you that you will leave Sweden with a lot of new customers. That's our aim. So, and this is also thanks to Vidnova, I would say, and the Swedish uh, Innovation Agency, because they are funding the trip over here and so on. Wow, thanks a lot. I mean, that's kind of the best price imaginable. So, I mean, already so far the whole event is a big price. So yesterday we had the honor to kick off the AI landscape. Uh, tomorrow we have great meetings with Husqvarna, for example, Airbnb, uh, looking for, for, for that. So and now you're even doubling down on that. Yeah. Great, 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 great event so far, really. Super, I'm happy to hear that you are happy. Then we are happy. Then we are happy. That's why we are here, <laughs> you know, to support you, the startups. So, so I, will, I will not post this to you. You will get it when you get there. Or maybe I should post it. I will post it. Okay. <laughs> Let's post it on LinkedIn and uh, connect with you, Blinkin. Uh, congrats to you and uh, what a great prize. And uh, that's kind of uh, unvaluable to see, uh, to get away with some new customers. Hmm. But talking about value, we have been discussing value a lot. Uh, what if you could go more deep into the value that Ignite is creating? Can you tell me more? Absolutely, and I think, uh, I think you are seeing a picture here uh, of a four field that uh, we, ha we have a research team actually that have been following Ignite now for since spring, uh, which has been quite interesting because since March, you know, everything is online. So it's been a, a quite a special time uh, for us as well. But um, I'm super happy with the four field that they have uh, found and, uh, and created for us because and the, the researchers are named Thomas Blomqvist, Medheim Geim and Sweet Nair and they're from Umeå University. Because I think this, this actually illustrates um, the value creation of Ignite in a very, very interesting way. Uh, first of all, you have the matching where, you know, it's kind of obvious, like the Uppsala uh, case that you also heard this morning that they needed a better way to interact with, with, their, with the people living in Uppsala uh, to actually understand what, what, they, what they are thinking about uh, the development of the city. Uh, so, and that was a quite simple match. They met Parlametric, uh, and Parlametric had the solution for, for supporting with that. Uh, but then uh, we are moving on to the more advanced uh, value creations uh, that we also find very, very interesting. It's about when people uh, when, when a, the large company meets a startup and the startup understands that, hey, this is a totally new field for us. With our technology, we can actually solve a problem that we didn't knew existed before meeting this corporate. And that's kind of like universes and ABB. Universes were targeting the, uh, the gaming industry with their solution. But it turned out that their solution was excellent or brilliant even uh, for, for automated mining. So. Uh, and I think you should really read this one, and I think Linus is actually posting it again on, on, in the chat, because it's a great article as well, uh, combined with this uh, forefield. And uh, what about the process Ignites yeah. are going? Can you, can you, I mean, we heard about the matchmaking, we heard about everything mm. that's going on, and I know the hours and the, the things that are behind it. Yeah. Can you share some more about it? Absolutely, and I think now you're seeing a picture of our our process actually and uh, the thing is the most important I think and that we've heard that all the day as well is how to find the right person 
in that large organization. That's super tricky, of course, uh, because you see the brand and you figure out that, hmm, I would like that, well, I would love to work with uh, IKEA, for example, but finding that person, that entrepreneur that actually has the budget and has the possibility to make things happen, that's super, super tricky for a startup, of course. You can't just call a number and then the person is there. So that's, I would say that we are in Ignite, we're devoting like 50% of our time to, actually to track down these fantastic people that are actually the, the people that are, are making this possible. And that's the first step in, in our process. Uh, and then when we have found them, we, we do some, we have an assess needs assessment model. Um, and we do these uh, needs assessments in various ways. Sometimes it's a huge workshop and we gather like 20, 25 people actually at a large company to get the whole spectra of challenges that a startup could possibly solve all the way from you know, the universe's case. Okay, <laughs> we need our robots to, to see in the dark uh, all the way to you know, the uh, challenges when it comes to environmental issues and, and those kind of things. So really the full spectrum. And then, then we're very happy because then we can match probably 40 startups uh, to give them a, a chance with this large company. And sometimes it's very, you know, the, the corporate have like one or, or three challenges that are very specific, like within AI. And then we are targeting those. So that's what we do. And then after that, then we go out and find the right startups for that and prep the startups with sales trainings, for example. And that is what we have been doing for the last month, uh, doing the needs assessment, yep. prepping both the startups mm -hmm. and the corporates. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so what about tomorrow? What happens? How many corporates are joining? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we are actually very, very proud. And I think you can see all the logos at this very point. Uh, We've gathered not less than 68 large companies for the matchmaking tomorrow, but we have, and, and uh, as Maria, as you say, this have been a very long process, of course. We started this already before summer, uh, because otherwise it wouldn't be <laughs> possible for us to do this qualitative uh, matching that, that we have been working with. So, and I'm especially glad that uh, this event allowed us also to open up these possibilities for the international startups. Uh, during this pandemic, it's of course extremely hard for the startups, for, I mean, for the smallest and youngest companies. Uh, they're really struggling now with uh, businesses and with the economic situation and so on. So I really hope that, that this will bring a lot of new value for all the startups uh, participating. Yeah, I think so. And I think also we have a lot of values that will be measured later on, collaboration in different forms. Uh, for me, example, we see a lot of opportunities with Canada, Umeå in Canada, that has been starting to work together. Absolutely. Um, so it's really exciting to see. Yeah. This is just a starting point, I it's think. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I think that we... Yeah, have how many meetings are there? Yeah, exactly. Um, Drum roll. Drum roll. You probably bump. see the picture already. <laughs> uh, it's actually going to be 435 meetings tomorrow. That's amazing. That's quite yeah. amazing, yeah. Normally, during one year, we do 1,000. During one year, and then we have like 15 uh, matchmaking days. But uh, tomorrow, we are obviously almost doubling that uh, in, in just one day. So, yeah, it's quite intense, and we have a <laughs> huge team. Uh, Don't forget the time zones. I mean, exactly. the meetings are starting at 6 a.m. tomorrow. The, the, the meetings, the first meeting will, will start at 6 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, and uh, the last meeting ends at 10 o'clock in the evening yeah. here uh, for us then. So, yeah. yeah, it's been only to, you know, do the counting <laughs> to understand the time zones ha have been it's a, a challenge. small challenge. But there are, I mean, we've been a part of this, and I think this is an amazing team that has been working. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we should be proud that we, we could do that. We should be super proud. Do you know how many that no. have been working? No. I think we have an image for that too. We've been no less than 64 people working with this. Mm. And what we have done is also that all of the co-hosts in all of the nine countries have learned the Ignite model and have helped with engaging these large companies from each and every country. So 
this hadn't been possible without all of us coming together to do this. So I'm super impressed, humble, and uh, I'm very, very, very happy and proud uh, of each and one. Mm. And imagine the growth here from uh, we, we started the conversation today about four years ago when we met. Mm -hmm. uh, the team was a little bit smaller yes. uh, <laughs> and it has grown. And yes. uh, what, what finds so uh, amazing for me, it's the passion for helping the startups mm. yes. and creating value. Everyone that works with this. So, so a big thanks to everyone. And uh, the thing that we are really looking forward to is tomorrow. Uh, to see all the meetings. To see all the meetings, yeah. but that's not it, you know. Even if you don't have a meeting, or mm. even if you have a meeting, uh, all of these fantastic uh, co-hosts, and we are nine different uh, sites, innovation sites in Sweden, and nine different uh, innovation sites uh, in the world. Uh, that have been creating this together. And as a startup, we know that, okay, finding your first customer is in another country is something super important, but then you also need to tap into the local ecosystem and the regional ecosystem. So tomorrow, uh, both for, for everyone, uh, we have a track called Discovery, yeah. uh, where you get the chance to actually listen to the, all the co-hosts' environment uh, and talk to them and make contacts for further tapping into each other's ecosystems. And I think that's also a great opportunity to grab. Yeah, it's a unique opportunity. So if you're listening to this and share this, share the, the information yeah. to people that you know should be interesting, because this is what we talked about together, sharing connections, sharing uh, every information that you get here. So stay on the chat, uh, share your thoughts and everything that might create more value. And then also, last but not least, we need to mention something also very important happening tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Because uh, all of you countries that are participating, um, there's also some funding opportunities that will be presented. Mm. Uh, so Vinova, uh, among others, will have a track called Funding Opportunities. Yeah. And if you find someone uh, during these days that you would like to start to initiate a, a collaboration with, there's large opportunities for you to actually search for some base funding so that you can start off that collaboration very fast. So I really encourage everyone to mm. not miss that one too. So I can't even count how many different events and masterclass and workshops and meetings all together. But it's a lot. It's and a lot. Yeah. It's just a starting point. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think we could uh, celebrate right now that uh, the schedule is done for tomorrow. Now it's up for the heroes uh, from the corporates and the startups. And a big shout out to you. We have heard all about the open mindset, getting into the meetings and listening to each other, sharing. And uh, what else would you like to address to them? Be open. Yeah. Be open to the opportunities. As we said, uh, a startup and corporate meeting uh, that's, of course, you can have the obvious meeting, like in the first quadrant of this four field, and that's quite easy, but uh, most of the meetings aren't that obvious. So be really open and explore opportunities together, uh, and we know that there are a lot of opportunities there. And normally, 42% of our meetings leads on to further dialogue, so don't disappoint us. <laughs> That's a good final one. So uh, thank you all of you for attending the Ignite conference. Uh, and congrats to Blinking for winning the competition uh, for a great pitch. And uh, a great pitch to all of you eight others who were doing the competition. And also thank you all for sharing in the chat, for being a part of it, and to the corporates and the startups everyone who's been a part of it. And thank you, Stina, for starting this. You're the champion for me with your passion. So hopefully just, we will be even more. <laughs> we will take this on. Absolutely. And thank you, Maria, for doing such a wonderful moderation today. You are the best. Thank and you I'm so super much. happy for that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all uh, th for joining us. And see you again soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you.